السلام عليكم اسعد الله تعالى صباحكم بكل خير اهلا وسهلا ومرحبا بكم في اليوم العلمي السنوي لكليه الطب البشري بالجامعه الطبيه الدوليه انطلاقا مما توليه الجامعه الدوليه للعلوم الطبيه من اهتمام كبير للانشطه التعليميه التي تعدها من اولى اولوياتها ومن اهدافها الرئيسيه التي تطمح من خلالها الى تحقيق رسالتها العلميه في نشر المعرفه الى جانب التدريس وخدمه المجتمع ككل فقد شرعت كليه الطب البشري لعقد يومها العلمي السنوي الاول في موعده والذي سيعطى اونلاين بسبب جائحه كورونا تحت شعار كورونا ارا وورك از والذي سيتم فيه مناقشه عديد من الانشطه التي اعدها الطلاب خلال فتره الدراسه والتي ستكون متمثله في البرزنتيشنز او العروض التقديميه الجورنال كلوب الديبيت او المناظرات والريسيرش سمري فلنبتدئ معا اولى فقراتنا اليوم ونترككم مع كلمه الافتتاح لهذا اليوم مع عميد كليه الطب البشري الاستاذ الدكتور جمال الطريق فليتفضل مشكورا. السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته بدايه نرحب بجميع الحضور الذين اهتموا بالتواجد في هذا اليوم اليوم العلمي لكليه الطب البشري والذي يقيم تنفيذا لما اتفق عليه في المجلس الاكاديمي للجامعه باقامه ايام علميه لكافه كليات الجامعه. اليوم العلمي يقيمه الطلبه سيكون عن بعد وبعض هذه الاعمال موجوده في مقر الكليه سيتخلل هذا النشاط مجموعه من الاعمال تشمل تقديم عروض مرئيه وقيام الطلبه بتقديم مناظرات علميه وهذه احدى انشطه الكليه واحدة طرق التعلم في الكليه التي تتنفذ بشكل دوري كذلك سيكون هناك عرض بعض البحوث وتكون هناك مجموعه من ورش العمل والمناقشات ما بين الطلبه والحضور اونلاين فكل من يرغب في المداخله او السؤال او نقاش نقطه معينه مرحب به نحن فخورون بما يقوم به طلبتنا وما تقوم به الجامعه الليبيه الدوليه للعلوم الطبيه من نشاطات علميه نتمنى لكم ان تستفيدوا وان تستمتعوا بما سيقدم في هذا البرنامج وتحيه لكم ونلتقي في ايام علميه قادمه اخرى باذن الله. السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته. نترككم الان مع فقره العروض التقديميه او البرزنتيشنز تلقيها عليكم الطالبه ملاك الصادق طالبه بكليه الطب البشري في السنه الخامسه. تفضلي ملاك. Hello everybody, my name is Malak Sadiq, finally in medical student at Limu, and this is my presentation about COVID-19. The introduction, the major focus of this presentation is the emerging of the COVID-19, how was identified the interface between health economic system and the infectious disease, particularly in the context of the human coronavirus and the rule of the individual behavior in this infectious disease transmission. Important question that we'll be able to answer by the end of this presentation, what's the COVID-19? What's coronavirus? What are the signs and symptoms? What's outbreak pandemic? And what's the RO? Coronavirus are a large family of virus. They get their name from the crowd-like spikes. They can be seen only on the surface with electron microscopy. They were first identified in the middle of the 1960. The virus causing the disease, severe acute respiratory syndrome, or SARS in 2002, was associated with the civet cats. And the virus causing the Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome, MERS, in 2012, was associated with dormitory camels. This virus didn't always, but could cause severe disease in a human. The new type of coronavirus causing COVID-19 and cases were first reported in Wuhan City, China in December 2019. Many early cases were associated with the Wuhan Seafood Wholesale Market. It's not yet clear with which animal the new coronavirus is associated with. Coronavirus affects the airway, the breathing, passage, or respiratory tract. Symptoms can be mild, like the common cold, including a runny nose and cough. However, the symptoms can be more severe and can cause, for example, difficulty in breathing. Severe illness was seen not infrequently in cases of MERS and SARS. So far, we know that not everyone infected with the virus causing the COVID-19 has symptoms. 
Common symptoms are fever, cough, and feeling tired. Some people become seriously ill, for example, the elderly people who have other health problems. In mass, the case fatality rate was high, over a third of cases died. In SARS, it was lower, with 1 in 10 people dying. At the present for COVID-19, it's around 2%, which is 1 in, two, in 50 people with the disease dying. Respiratory viruses are usually transmitted through either droplet, aerosols, or conduct. Droplet, a large particle that travels less than 1 meter, smaller particle can form aerosols and may tra travel farther. Contact is usually from droplets landing on an object, which are then touched by another person who then touches their eyes, nose, or mouth. The main way the, vi the virus causing the COVID-19 seems to spread via droplet. For example, when someone coughs or through contact with droplet on another object, if the eyes, nose, or mouth are then touched, potentially for transmission by aerosols, the smaller particle is under investigation. How virus spread inform the measure to prevent it. So, to prevent droplet or contact, transmission, washing hand, maintaining the distance from those coughing or sneezing, not touching your hand or mouth can all help to prevent the infection. How was identified? In COVID-19 outbreak, a cluster of cases of pneumonia were first identified. To determine the cluster of cases is an outbreak, they need to be linked to a time, place as they were. 31st of December 2019, cluster of cases of pneumonia of unknown etiology, detected in Wuhan City, China. China alert the WHO, the World Health Organization, China Country Affairs. 12 of January 2020, China shared the genetic sequence of the novel of the novel coronavirus. In this early phase, protocol for the diagnosis and treatment, surveillance, epidemiological investigation, management of close contact, and diagnostic testing were being developed. Past charts showing the increase in the cases of the COVID-19 over the first two months of the outbreak in Wuhan City. As we see in this past chart, there is increase in the number of cases. But once they start using the protocol, there is a decline in the number of the cases. So, in 11 of February 2020, the virus and the disease it causes were officially named. The novel coronavirus was named Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, SARS-CoV-2, and the disease it causes COVID-19. Surveillance of the outbreak continued, and with new data case definition for the COVID-19 were updated. 11 of March 2020, the WHO Director General declared the COVID-19 outbreak is a pandemic. Identification of the genome sequence. Since, since China was the source of the area of the outbreak, they played a big role in identification the whole genome of the virus, and it was ready in very short time. And that helped in early diagnosis of the disease and, det and detection of the new cases. From the genome sequence, we were able to identify the novel region of the genome and also therefore develop new molecular diagnostic tool from that. The role of individual behavior in this the infectious disease transmission. First of all, we need to check about the infections of this disease. We will look at how measure the infections. So imagine a population where one person gets a virus and they transmit to two people. And each of these people transmitted to two people. You can see that the number of the people infected would increase quite quickly in the population. And if each person transmitted to three, it would increase more quickly. The basic case reproduction number, the RO, is a measure of the spread. It's average number of successful transmission by case when everyone in the population is susceptible. The reproduction number is above one. Case of number would increase. If the reproduction number equal one, case number are stable and average. Each case gives rise just one more cases. And when the reproduction number is less than one, the case number decreases. So it's clearly important to know that the reproduction number for the COVID-19 because it's caused by a new virus, SARS-CoV-2. We can assume everyone is susceptible. We can estimate the reproduction number by looking at the average number of the secondary cases per case. If we can find the chain of transmission or from looking at how cases increase in the population over time which is known as the epidemic care. 
How does the COVID-19 compare to other infectious diseases? The reproduction number is much lower than for infectious, which are known to transmit particularly easily, such as measles, chicken pox. It's similar in range to SARS, Ebola, and seasonal influenza. Another way to measure the infectious is the secondary attack rate. It's a measure of spread. Of or in a specific situation, for example, in household, it's defined as the proportion of those exposed to the primary case that developed the disease as a result of that exposure. Unfortunately, there is limited information on the secondary attack rate for the virus causing COVID-19. So, the reproduction number is the sum of the secondary attack rate in each situation multiplied by the number of the contact in the situation. People and our health system. Our people, us, is the key point in this whole pandemic. So I'm just going to concentrate at this. Risk communication and community engagement is a critical component of the response to the infectious disease outbreak. What this look, looks like depends very much on the context and the disease in question. It could range from social mobilization of staff, having face-to-face -face discussion with the community members at their doorstep, all the way through to large mass and social media campaigns, sponsorship of a public event like football match, or even community theater performance that help describe the risk of uh, catching particular disease and how to protect ourselves and our people. Lastly, the economic health and health system. The infection prevention control. The aim of the infection prevention control in the context of an outbreak of the novel acute respiratory infection such as SARS-CoV-2 causing COVID-19 are uh, promptly identify and treat any suspect or confer confirmed cases in such a way as protect the staff and the patient in the risk of a health facility. If a health facility if health facilities become com compromised during an outbreak, this can pose fuel the wider outbreak and impact border health services to determine the population. Transmission based precautions. The World Health Organization currently recommends standard droplet and contact percussion are employed for all suspect and confirmed COVID 19 cases. Patients should be isolated and wear masks if they have to transit through the shared area. Staff should wear gloves, gown, eye protection, and medical mask within one meter of the patient as a minimum. As a minimum. More extensive environment cleaning should be conducted using any of readily available disinfectant and air pore percussion implemented during aerosolous generation generating procedure. Challenging in implementation. Challenging and implementation exists at all levels of the health system in country without comprehensive national program for infection prevention and control, special training programs and dedicated staff to implement national guidance. It's more challenging to implement infection prevention control as a part of outbreak preparedness or response. There are also challenges specific to every health facility. The result of the preparedness self-assessment should highlight the key cases to priorities. This could be repeated periodically to monitor the effect of transmission. Lastly, the conclusion. In summary, to better understand the potential for the spread of the SARS-CoV-2 in different geographical and contexts in, and in the most vulnerable population worldwide, we need to determine the reproduction number, establish the proportion of those infected that develop the symptoms and seek care, find out the duration of the infections and its relationship to symptoms, investigation the main routes of transmission and see if there are any other rare routes, establish the risk factor for infection and severe disease, and identify the risk factors for the super spreading events. All these areas of study plus the natural history and origin of the SARS-CoV-2 are the focus of the WHO Research Blueprint, which researchers around the world, around the world now striving to address. And this was my presentation. Wish you enjoyed it. Thank you. Today, our topic is about the surgical site infection. And in this lecture, 
we will discuss the definition of the surgical site infection and its causes, the risk factor of the risk factors of the surgical site infection. Then we will discuss the classifications of the surgical site infection. Then we will discuss the how to preventing the surgical site infection. At the end of the lecture, we will discuss if, it, if the surgical infection has happened and the complications started. Starting complication, how to treat it before the complication or after the complication. The surgical infection is a major problem in surgical practice. In 1992, the U.S. Center for Disease Control revised it, its definition of the wound infection, <coughs> creating the, uh, the definition of the surgical site infection. Why? To prevent the confusion between the uh, infection of the surgical incision and the infection of the traumatic wound accounts for 15 to 25 percent of the surgical infections of all surgical infections and increased cost to healthcare. The surgical site infection defined as an invasion of the organism. Surgical infection defined as the invasion of the organism through tissue, leading to, uh, to breaking down of the local and systemic host defenses. That lead to local and systemic presentation like redness, hotness, swelling, bus discharge, and so on. And the, the surgical side infection can be exogenous or caused by exogenous or endogenous. Exogenous, it means from the environment, from the, uh, I mean, it means nosocomia. And endogenous means from the patient himself. Here we have a microorganism that lead to the, that may cause a surgical infection, like the most common one is Staph aureus, Enterococci, Escherichia coli, and Pseudomonas. Staph uh, aureus counting 90% as what you see here. The risk factors of the surgical site infection. Generally, we have the general risk factors like poor general conditions like uh, old, old age patients, uh, obese patients, mal malnutrition, uh, and some patients have a systemic disease like uh, diabetes mellitus, patient of uh, immunosuppressant patient, patient have uh, an HIV, and the other risk factors, we call it local risk factors like poor blood supply, it could be poor blood supply, poor surgical technique, poor sterilization, foreign body presence or dead tissue, uh, hematoma, hypoxia, hypothermia, and uh, depends on the nature of, also nature of the operation. If it, this operation is clean or contaminated or clean contaminated or dirty. The classification of the surgical site infection. It depends on the etiology, time, severity, and depth of the wound. Depends on the etiology, it could be primary, acquired from the community or indigenous source, such as what that following a perforated peptic ulcer. The secondary one or exogenous acquired from the OT, such as inadequate air uh, filtration or uh, from contaminated at contamination at uh, or after surgery, for example, unsmoking leak. Then we uh, depends on the time. It could be early infection present within 30 days of uh, uh, procedure or intermediate intermediate occurs between the one of the first to the third month or late late present after three months of surgery then on the severity we got a minor surgical site infection wound infections may be discharge bus or infected surface of fluid but should not be associated with a with a, an excessive discomfort or systemic signs or delay in the return home.
while the, ma the, the second one is a major surgical site infection defined as a wound that either discharge significant quantities of pus spontaneously or needs a secondary procedure to drain it. It depends on the depth we have, like what you see here, the superficial intestinal surgical site infection involving the skin and subcutaneous tissue, while the deep incisional surgical site infection involves the deep soft tissue that involve the fascia and muscles. The last one that involves uh, the uh, organs and the space or called it space surgical site infection that involves the deep organs, any part of organs. The further classification. Further classification could be a clean operation. Uh, for example, elective surgery, fish, and there is no entering or risk, or risk uh, of the infection can less than 1.5%. The other one is a clean contaminated. Clean contaminated elective entering. For example, respiratory, GIT, genetic urinary tract risk of the infection less than 3%. I mean, the other one, contaminated or contaminated operation. For example, an emergency or penetrated trauma less than four hours, entry to the track with the infected bile, urine, for example. Or risk of the infection, 5%, just 5%. Yeah, 5%. The dirty operation, like abscess penetrating trauma more than four hours, the up perforation of tracts or risk of the infection will be from the 33 or to the 50 percent. The complication of the surgical site infection. The complication of the surgical site infection, like we have a fistula that may form in a fistula, sinus, sepsis, abscess formation, abscess formation, abscess formation. Um, it may suppress the wound healing and um, make the wound dead. How to preventing the surgical infection from happening? Pre op staff should always wash their hands and patients. Uh, 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 Pre-operative shaving should be avoided if possible. And um, attention to the theater technique, avoid the hypothermia, and ensure supplemental oxygen in recovery. Operation, the uh, oper operation theater, ensure sterile caps, masks, gowns, gloves used. Skin cleaning, um, um, gentle tissue handling, absolute hemostasis, appropriate sutures, materials, avoiding dead space. Post op, we get our post op and antibiotic, appropriate antibiotic and prophylaxis. But antibiotic do not replace a surgical drainage of infection. Only spreading infection or signs of the systemic infections, infection, just that just they use for of the antibiotic. That's why we use the antibiotic. Antibiotic therapy approach. A narrow spectrum antibiotic may be used to treat a uh, known sensitive infection, known bacteria. The new antibiotic should be used with a caution and wherever the possible sensitivities should first be obtained. A combination of the broad spectrum antibiotics can be used when the organism is not known or when it's suspected that several bacteria acting in, the, in this infection, in this surgery, may be responsible for the infection. The prophylaxis, empirical covering against expected pathogens with the local hospital guidelines. Single shoot IV administration at induction of anesthesia. Continue as a therapy if there is a 
unexpected contamination, patients with a heart valve disease or bupitiasis should be protected from the bacteremia caused by dental work, urethral instrumentation, or visceral surgery. If the, the surgical infection has happened already, how to treat it? The treatment depends on the type of the surgical side infection. But we've got a steps. A surgical debridement, we may uh, do a surgical debridement of the wound with suture removed, a free drainage by reopening an uh, affected part of uh, the incision and the drainage bus. Um, a fluid culture, culture sensitivity and suitable antibiotic. Give the patient a fluid, take a sample for culture and sensitivity or not a suitable antibiotic. Signs of healing. If there is a signs of the of healing in your secondary suture. This is my this is the reference that I use it in the in this lecture. And uh, thank you. Now I will let you with my colleague. Madlil Abbar to talk about the some studies about the surgical site infection. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. My name is Madlil Abbar and I will present the second part of a presentation. I will talk about implementation strategies to reduce surgical site infections. So Abstract background, surgical site infections brought in high patients, morbidities, and mortalities. Although evidence-based clinical interventions can reduce SSIs, they are not reliably delivered in the practice, and the data are limited on the best approach to improve adherence. Objective, to summarize the implementation strategies aimed at improving adherence to evidence-based interventions that reduce SSIs, design systemics review, methods they use, structure form to extract data on implementation strategies and group them into implementation models called four E's, engage, educate, execute, evaluate. Results in the total 125 studies meet our inclusion criteria, but only 80 studies meet EVOCA criteria, which limited the ability to identify the best practice. Engagement strategies include multidisciplinary work and a strong leadership involvement. Education strategies included various approach to introduce the evidence-based practice to clinicians and patients. Execution strategies standardize the interventions into the simple take to facilitate uptakes. Evaluation strategies assist adherence with evidence-based interventions and patients outcome, providing feedback of performance to providers. Conclusions, multi-phase implementation strategies represent the most common approach to facilitating the adoptions of evidence-based practice. They believe this, uh, these summaries of implementations complement existing clinical guidelines and may accelerate effort to reduce SSIs. Introduction, surgical site infections, as we know, it's a global problem associated with increased mortalities and hospital length of stay, hospital readmission and cost. So the model also has been used to initiate to prevent thromboembolic event and to increase the early mobilities practice among the hospitalized patients and focus to administrative and the clinical stakeholder and has technical adaptive culture work to foster the translations of evidence into the bedside practice. Methods, data source and search strategies, they search in the PubMed, NPAYS, Cochrane Library, WHOs from January 1990s through the December 2015. Inclusions and exclusion criteria, it's a legal studies, included experimental observation studies, randomized control trials, control before and after studies, interrupted time series studies, qualities improvement initiative, so all surgical patient population and setting in patient or outpatients and patients of all age were included. Study selection and data extractions. Articles were selected in the several phase. First six reviewers independently screening the title and generated at least potential abstract for inclusions. Second four authors, 
was independently review with the abstract, identify article for full text review, and read the article for illegalities. Analysis of implementation strategies, they summarize the implementation strategies according the four E's as I mentioned before, and these categories were not always mutually exclusive. Reviewers decide on the best fit through the group consensus. Demographic characteristic, over all 105 studies, 84% were conducting in the high income countries and 60% in the low middle income countries. So they quantified the studies by surgical specialities, 21 orthopedic and 22 cardiothoracic, 13 obstetrician and gynecologists, 23 gastrointestinal, three neurosurgery, two plastic surgery, and 28 multiple specialities and 13 undefined specialties. Adherence to exercise preventions. So the most common measures was appropriated use of surgical antibiotic prophylaxis, which reported in 86 of 125 studies, 68%, and 40 of 20 70% studies conducting in the low middle income countries. Other preventions like wound care, reoperative bathings, gloving techniques, hair removal technique, and many others. So engagement strategies among all of the studies, 76, 63% described effort to engage frontline and staff as an implementation strategies, largely by forming multidisciplinary team so these photos show infections control and hospital epidemiologists record identified through database searchings was 30,798 recorded after duplicated removal of 9,823 and recorded screening was 2,481s. Record excluded was 7,342. Full text article assessed for illegalities was 375, and studies included in the quantitative synthesis was 125, and the studies that meet EVOCA criteria was eight. Education strategies in the total 65 studies, 54% used some form of staff educations like traditional teaching methods included large group workshop and ground round and other like briefing and debriefing sessions and life stimulations. And these tables show the infections prevention control measures like surgical antimicrobial prophylaxis, 84 of all studies, 125 and 14 in the low middle income countries. Another example like gloving technique in 10 of 125 studies and zero in the low middle income countries. Execution strategies described by 108 of 125 studies, 86% executions often focus to interventions by simplifying and standardizing the care delivery process and creating verification check. Furthermore, 57 studies, 46% implemented protocol, pathway, and policies to improve adoptions of prevention measures. Evaluation strategies of 125 studies, 74 studies, 59% described evaluation activities with a general focus on giving feedback to key stakeholders to support improvement efforts. Conclusions and these systemics review, they identify 125 studies that describe implementation strategies to increase the adoptions of evidence exercise prevention measures. So these strategies aim to build up and encourage the multidisciplinary teamwork to obtain leadership by end to increase the staff and patients awareness and knowledge about exercise and prevention practice to standardize and simplify clinical process and to create fortification procedures and to provide timely feedback to stakeholders to support improvement efforts. The new research regarding to the SSIs in Benghazi, Libya was conducting in Al Jala hospitals by Dr. Rotman Tajouri. They said in the background, surgical site infections are the most 
third most commonly reported nosocomial infections. Objective to find out the prevalence of SSI's risk factor implicated organism involvement, material and methods. So it's a descriptive case series of studies and data of 204 cases who underwent surgery in 2019. And the result was the most common organism that caused surgical site infection are staph aureus. So the recommendations, we should correcting the anemia before the surgery and decrease operations period might be reduced SSIs. So the key word, Jala Hospital, surgical site infections, emergency, staph aureus, prolonged hospital stay. And these are the references and thank you so much. Today's presentation will be about the valvular heart disease and the latest guidelines in the management of patients with valvular heart diseases. It will be presented by me, Wissam Fadel, and Nadia Alfituri. The objectives we intend to cover in our presentation include a brief introduction to valvular heart diseases, its epidemiology, class of recommendation and level of evidence, and then the updates on the guidelines of managing patients with valvular heart disease and the importance of these guidelines. We will begin with valvular heart diseases, which as we all know, it's a group of disorders characterized by damage to or a defect in one of the four heart valves, either the mitral, aortic, tricuspid, or the pulmonary valve. The defect leads to valve failure or dysfunction, which could result in diminishing the heart functionally. Although the particular consequences and complications depend entirely on the type and severity of the disease. The term valvular heart diseases covers a large number of disorders that could affect the valves, but the ones that are more commonly focused on include the aortic and mitral valve disorders, or as cardiologists refer to, the left-sided heart valves disorders. These include the aortic valve regurgitation or stenosis and the mitral valve regurgitation or stenosis. Also, the pulmonary and tricuspid valve disorders, or the right-sided heart valves disorders, which include the pulmonary valve regurgitation or stenosis and the tricuspid valve regurgitation or stenosis. Another group of disorders that affects the valves include the inflammatory diseases like infective endocarditis and rheumatic fever. Why are we interested in the management of valvular heart diseases? Well, because it does affect a considerable percent of the population. As this graph shows here, about 14% of the population above the age of 75 are diagnosed with a valve disorder. If we focus on the more common ones, like mitral valve diseases, it affects around 8% of the population between the age of 65 and 74, and around 10% of the population above the age of 75. As for aortic valve diseases, it affects around 2% of the population between the age of 65 and 74, and around 4% of the population above the age of 75. Knowing these numbers, we understand now that the burden of valvular heart disease is heavy on the community, and its management should be taken seriously. And for that, and since 1980, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association have translated scientific evidence into clinical practice guidelines with recommendations to improve the cardiovascular health care system regarding valvular heart diseases. These guidelines, which are based on systematic methods to evaluate and classify evidence, provide a cornerstone for the quality of cardiovascular care. These guidelines provide recommendations applicable to patients with or at high risk of developing cardiovascular disease. They're intended to define practice meeting the needs of patients in most, but not in all circumstances, and should not replace clinical judgment. Now, to ensure that these guideline recommendations remain up to date, the data are reviewed on an ongoing basis of an approximately six-year cycle. The focus of the 2014 guidelines for the management of patients with VHD was the diagnosis and management of adult patients. However, as the field of VHD is rapidly progressing with new knowledge of the natural history of patients with valve diseases, and since several randomized controlled studies have been published, particularly with regard to the outcomes of interventions, 
major areas have changed, including indications for surgical management for patients with mitral regurgitation and indications for transcatheter aortic valve replacement. The new and modified recommendations for each clinical section is included in the 2017 focused update of the 2014 guidelines for the management of patients with VHD. How are these guidelines stated? It depends on two parameters. These are the class of recommendation and level of evidence. To start with the class of recommendation, it indicates the strength of the recommendation by estimating the magnitude and the certainty of the benefit in proportion to the risk. There are five classes. We'll go over them, starting with class one, where the benefit is three times higher than the risk. When writing recommendations, the phrases used include is recommended and is indicated. And when comparing the effectiveness of treatment strategies, we use is recommended and should be chosen over. While class 2A, where the benefit is two times higher than the risk, we use phrases like is reasonable and can be useful. And when comparing the effectiveness of treatment strategies, we use probably recommended and is reasonable to choose. While in class 2B, where benefit is slightly higher than the risk or equal to the risk, we use phrases like may or might be reasonable. And when uh, comparing the effectiveness of treatment strategies, we use unknown or unclear. Class 3, moderate, where benefit is equal to the risk, we use phrases like is not recommended and not indicated. And class 3, strong, where risk is higher than the benefit, we use phrases like potentially harmful or associated with high percent of morbidity and mortality. The second parameter used is the level of evidence, which rates the quality of scientific evidence that supports the intervention on the basis of the type, quantity, and the consistency of data from clinical trials and other sources. There are five levels, starting with level A, where the evidence acquired is of high quality from more than one RCT, or meta-analysis of high quality RCTs, or one or more RCTs corroborated by high quality registry studies. Level B randomized is acquiring evidence of moderate quality from one or more RCTs or meta analysis of moderate quality RCTs. While level B non randomized is acquiring evidence of moderate quality from one or more well designed, well executed, non randomized studies observational studies or registry studies, or meta-analysis of such studies. Level C of limited data is when the evidence is acquired from randomized or non-randomized observational or registry studies with limitations of design or execution, or meta-analysis of such studies, or physiological or mechanistic studies in human subjects. While level C, expert opinion, is when the evidence is acquired from expert opinion based on clinical experience. And now the second part of today's presentation will be presented by Nadia Alfituri. In the second part of today's presentation, we will discuss the modified guidelines for the management of, of aortic stenosis and mitral regurgitation, according to the American Heart Association's 2017 updated guidelines. We will cover aortic stenosis treatment, including surgical aortic valve replacement and transcatheter aortic valve replacement. And then I will highlight new guidelines regarding mitral regurgitation, chronic primary and secondary intervention. As we know, aortic stenosis is the obstruction of blood flow across the aortic valve, and it is a chronic progressive disease that mostly affects the elderly. It produces obstruction of the left ventricular stroke volume, which may lead to symptoms such as chest pain, breathlessness, syncope and fatigue. However, some patients may be asymptomatic. It may be due to either a degenerative calcific aortic valve or a congenitally bicuspid valve or due to rheumatic heart disease. Firstly, Surgical aortic valve replacement. This is a class one recommendation and it is recommended in symptomatic and asymptomatic patients who meet an indication for aortic valve replacement and whose surgical risk is low or intermediate. The level of evidence has been updated from A to B and R. Prior recommendations did not take into consideration the symptomatic status of the patients. 
whereas now both symptomatic and asymptomatic patients are encompassed in these guidelines. Both patients show an excellent outcome after surgery, with relievement of symptoms and improvement of left ventricular stroke volume. Whether surgical or transcatheter aortic valve replacement is used, it is recommended for symptomatic patients who are at high surgical risk. The choice depends on patient-specific surgical risk and also patient's choice and personal preference. The class of recommendation has been updated from 2A to 1 and the level of evidence has been updated from B to A. Longer term follow-ups and additional RCTs have demonstrated that transcatheter aortic valve replacement is equivalent to surgical aortic valve replacement with the same outcome. Transcatheter aortic valve replacement is recommended for symptomatic patients who have a prohibitive risk for surgical aortic valve replacement. Class of recommendation is class 1 and the level of evidence has been updated from B to A after random control studies and additional observational studies have shown that, it, that there is a benefit from transcatheter aortic valve replacement in patients who were previously deemed inoperable and showed an improvement in symptoms and reduction in rehospitalization in these patients. Transcatheter aortic valve replacement may also be considered in patients with an intermediate surgical risk. The choice depends on patient preference and specific risk. Class of recommendation is 2A and the level of evidence is BR in this case. This slide summarises the guidelines for management of severe aortic stenosis. As you can see, patients with low surgical risk are recommended for surgical aortic valve replacement and this is a class 1 recommendation. Patients with intermediate surgical risk are recommended for either surgical aortic valve replacement, this is a class 1 recommendation also, or transcatheter aortic valve replacement, class 2A recommendation. Patients at high surgical risk are recommended for both surgical and transcatheter aortic valve replacement, both being a class 1 recommendation. And patients with prohibitive surgical risk are now considered uh, eligible for transcatheter aortic valve replacement and this is a class 1 recommendation. The second part of today's presentation will be on mitral regurgitation which is defined as an abnormal reversal of blood flow from the left ventricle to the left atrium. It is caused by disruption of any part of the mitral valve apparatus and the most common etiologies of mitral regurgitation include mitral valve prolapse, rheumatic heart disease, infective endocarditis, annular calcification, cardiomyopathies and ischemic heart disease. The new guideline regarding chronic primary mitral regurgitation is that mitral valve surgery is now reasonable for asymptomatic patients with chronic severe primary mitral regurgitation. This is class 2A recommendation and the level of evidence is CLD. In regards to chronic secondary mitral regurgitation, guidelines have now been changed in that patients who have mitral regurgitation due to ischemic heart disease or heart failure, the usefulness of mitral valve repair in these patients is now uncertain. The level of evidence has been updated from C to BR. The 2014 recommendation supported mitral valve repair in this group of patients, but after random control trials showed no clinical benefit of mitral repair in this population, in contrast, it showed an increased risk of post-operative complications. Therefore, replacement in these patients is now uncertain. In summary of today's presentation, guideline recommended management is effective only when followed by healthcare providers and patients also. Adherence to recommendations can be enhanced by shared decision making between healthcare providers and patients, with patient engagement in selecting interventions based on individual values, preferences and associated conditions and comorbidities. The focus of these guidelines is on medical practice in the United States, but guidelines developed in collaboration with other organisations may have a global impact. Thank you for your attention. These are our references and for further reading we suggest reading the 2014 guidelines for management of patients with valvular heart disease. السلام عليكم انا محمد الراجي طالب سنه خامسه في الطب البشري في الجامعه الليبيه الدوليه حنكون اليوم المقدم لجلسه الدبيت او المناظره اليوم العلمي 
في كلية الطب البشري. والديبيت أو المناظرة هو نوع من أنواع الحوار بين طرفين أو أكثر يقوم أطراف أو التحاور حول قضية فيها إشكالية معينة. ويكون هناك فريق مؤيد وفريق آخر معارض لهذه الإشكالية. يقوم كل طرف بالحوار إثبات صحته صحة رأيه والدفاع عنها باستخدام حجج وبراهين علمية. كما يحاول إقناع الجماهير برأيه وحججه. وأيضا يحاول كل طرف إثبات خطأ موقف وراء الطرف الآخر. وكذلك من أجل من أجل الفوز في هذه المناظرة. تدار المناظرات ضمن قواعد وضوابط وشروط معينة تختلف حسب المكان المستضيع في هذه المناظرة وحسب نوع القضية المطروحة ومن فوائد المناظرات هي توطيد مفهوم التركيز في الحديث والحوار والاستماع والإصرار وكذلك العمل الجماعي ستكون مناظرة اليوم حول بعنوان Can doctors with HIV infection become surgeons وأطراف المناظرة هم طلاب السنة الخامسة وسيتم تقسيمه الى مجموعتين، المجموعه الاولى وهي المؤيده للفكره وهم محمد الصعيدي، خليفه جنيبر، محمد الغريان. والمجموعه الثانيه وهي المعارضه للفكره وهم هديد اللافي، ساره جازلي وهند رفاعي. اترك فرصه للمجموعه الاولى لتقديم الحجه الخاصه بهم، تفضلوا. So, uh, Ms. Khalifa Gnibur, and uh, I'll be discussing the biological aspect of, uh, of this matter. Uh, just to be clear, we're not willing to uh, make it our opponents change their minds regarding this topic. Like in, uh, the idea of changing or exchanging the uh, uh, different perspectives in this topic is itself very good. Um, the other thing is that it's a serious topic, and we're not going to say anything but the absolute truth to you. Amen. Okay, let's start. Uh, first of all, what is HIV or AIDS? As we all know, uh, AIDS or HIV is a human immune deficiency virus, which is a, which is a type of lintavirus, a subgroup from a retrovirus family. Uh, the, the, the virus that is responsible for the acquired immune deficiency, which is called AIDS. It's uh, virulence lies specifically in the fact that it invades our immune cells. Particularly, particularly in the helper T cells, which is responsible for the activation of almost uh, all the uh, adaptive immunity. HIV differ from other retroviruses in, it, in, in its shape and also in the fact that it's composed of two copies of positive uh, sin single stranded RNA, which makes it easy for it to replicate and uh, without you know, uh, forming the uh, messenger RNA and stuff. The other thing is that it composes, it's composed of many uh, any enzymes in, in a reverse tri transcriptase, with uh, proteases, with ribonuclease, with integrase, which all participate in its replication and transcription and uh, forming multiple variants that is highly effective. The truth regarding HIV or AIDS is um, uh, that it continues to be a major global public health issue, having claimed more than 32 million lives so far. The other thing is that 37.9 million people living with HIV at the end of uh, 2080, with 1.7 million people becoming newly infected in 2080 globally. The most advanced stage of HIV is a monocleation with acquired immune deficiency syndrome, which can take from several years to uh, 15 years to develop. بس ما ننسوش نقولوا ان هنا نحن نادينا نقرا على واحد مش واخد اي تريتمنت احنا قاعدين نقرا على الطبيعه نتاعنا هو اصلا هي ستارت ديسكفرينغ انه هو انفكتد امتى لما يوصل للايدز هذه يبدا يبدا عنده ريكيرنت انفكشنز وكي فبالتالي شنو قاعد يشوف يلقى روحه انه هو هو هافينغ اتش اي بي او اتش اي بي بوزيتيف For its transmission, HIV can be transmitted by exchange of variety of blood body fluids uh, of the infected individuals such as blood Breast milk, semen, or vaginal secretion of sebum. But for the sake of uh, preventing HIV st st uh, stigma, uh, individuals cannot become infected through any you know, daily life activity, uh, including hugging, shaking hands, even sharing the personal objects, including food and water. For the non incubational risks of getting infected with HIV, um, there are multiple things, including unprotected uh, intercourse. 
having uh, another sexually transmitted infection. Science says now when you have another uh, STD, uh, the ability of HIV to shed from the uh, vaginal uh, or penile wall is easier. Uh, sharing contaminated needles, syringes, and other injecting equipments and drug solutions when injecting drugs. And receiving unsafe injections, blood transfusion, tissue transplant, medical procedures that involve unsterile, uh, they piercing. Hal هناك a cure for HIV. تمام. طبعا before we start talking about the cure نفسها, the treatment itself is divided into two main, two main categories. في حاجة يقولها ال sterilizing treatment في حاجة أخرى يسموها فيها شنو ال suppressing treatment. The sterilizing treatment, as the name indicates, and it involves eliminating or eradicating the virus by 100% from blood. And I'm looking for some viruses or microorganisms that has the ability to invade or become latent. Uh, eradicating treatment is not a If you have no other treatment, some of the functional inhibiting or suppressing treatment. And you convert the virus or microorganism from the active state into the latent state. This is the treatment in general. In HIV, when it came out, it was treated as any retroviral. But we said that it was retroviral and other retroviruses. So what was the mono-anti-retroviral therapy itself didn't work upon it. We said that there are more than one enzyme. When you give it a single enzyme, there are other enzymes that have the ability to replicate forming further virions and things like that. But in CDC in 2016, I would hope, they developed a new therapy program with some of the highly active antiretroviral therapy. It was one of the one, like a of three treatments that could you know, act very effectively, has a greater chance of inhibiting or suppressing the virus. تمام فهذه هي الفكره وبالتالي بيشنت يكون شنو يعني يكون اول حاجه الكونسنتريشن تاع الفيروس اتسلف ديكريس تو ا ليفل وير يعني انه هو ما ما فيش حتى از نوت كونسيدر تو بي افكتد لان ما فيش اي فلور اوف سيمتومز او حتى يعني ساينز او اي حاجه تمام وخلاص فلذلك الساينتست يعني ثار اباوت انه شنو ليش ما نقدر شنو ظل معنا احنا خلاص البيشنت انه هو ما فيش اي سيمتومز ليش ما نحن الحاجه الوحيده اللي نقدر نديروها اخرى ان نحن نمنع اتس ترانسميشن فكيف نقدر ندير الحاجه هذه؟ هذا علاش ذي ديفولت السو كولد اللي هو البروفايلاكسس هذا بروجرامز اللي هنا اثنين في واحد يقولوا له البري اكسبوجر بروفايلاكسس بروجرام والاذر اللي هو من بوست اكسبوجر بروفايلاكسس البري اكسبوجر از نيم انديكيتس طبعا في تو مين تايبس في ذا وان ذات از تيكن ريجولاري اللي هو وان تابلت بير دي والاذر اللي هو يسموه فيه اون ديماند يعني اون اكسبوجر سواء كان موضوع مثلا ان مثلا سكشولي او كان موضوع انه شنو؟ انه مثلا زي مثلا اوكيبيشنال زي مثلا ان اور كيس السيرجن الاون ديماند فكرته انه تو تابلتس 24 اور بيفور اند 24 اند تابلت شنو؟ وان تابلت 24 اور افتر وبعدين تاخذ بعدها يعني بيومين ايوه تاخذ شنو؟ تاخذ انا تابلت البوست اكسبوجر بروفايل اكسس زمان واز كونسيدرد از ان ايمرجنسي اكت كان الفكره منه انه واحد ما يقدرش يعرف الشخص اللي قدامه عنده ولا ما عندهش لكن شنو مجرد ما يشك او يحس ان الشخص اللي قدامه عنده اتش اي في فيعدي شنو؟ يعدي ياخذه في غضون 72 hours لكن زي ما حتقول الدراسه اللي توها حنحكي عليها كل مكان اسرع كل مكان احسن يعني في غضون 24 hours مرات تكون احسن تمام في تو ستاديز ذات اي براد One was done by a partner in health. It involved homosexual couples. It's not in our topic, and it discusses the transmission itself. The first one was a partner by partners. It involved homosexual couples. One partner was HIV positive, but other was HIV negative. And they were allowed to, you know, to do the some official unprotected intercourse. تمام. الدراسة هذه وجدت عليهم كانت تشوف هل ال zero negative هذوما هيبي to positive ولا لا. في حين ال zero positive اللي اللي عندهم HIV كان يأخذ في شنو في the pre exposure profile access. تمام. والدراسة دي استمرت من 2010 لعند 2018. تمام. الدراسة هذه وجدت إن كلهم الناس اللي هم were affected هذوما كلهم. قريب 948 واحد اظن 972 واحد تمام 15 منهم بس هم اللي قدوا الجماعه النيجاتيف يعني 
15 منهم بس اللي قالوا شنو سيرو بوزيتيف. When they were يعني جينيتيكلي اناليزد وجدوا ان شنو؟ وجدوا ان السيرو تايبس اللي عندهم مش نفس السيرو تايبس اللي عند their partners and once they were asked and يعني investigated it turned out to be the that they were cheating on their partners. فلذلك يعني حرفيا ان ما فيش اي نوع من ترانزميشن طالما انت خذيت البري اكسبوجر البروفايلاكسس بروجرام بصفه عامه لو انت جو ثرو ات حيجد عندك قاعده يسموا فيها هذا اللي they developed اللي هي undetectable معناها there is no transmission. تمام هذا بالنسبه للفيرست ستادي. The second study which is in our uh, topic اللي هي شنو occupational transmission of HIV اللي هو post exposure prophylaxis program. تمام الدراسه هذه was published by the public health England in, in 2015 الدراسه حاطين الريفرس بالاخير تقدر تشوفوها uh, between 2004 and 2013 a total of 1478 healthcare worker were reported as having having been exposed to patient blood containing HIV in the UK three quarters of these took in post exposure prophylaxis they were going to emergency act up. and almost all did so within you know, within 24 hours as early as possible so it turned out in national you know, No HIV infection as a result. تمام. هذا بالنسبة لل ال biological aspect of of this matter. Now I will allow my colleague Muhammad Alriani to to finish. تمام. شكرا خليفة. أنا محمد خليفة. رح نكمل إن شاء الله على على زميلي. طبعا كنا نقولوا ليش يعني عدد السرجنز مش شويه في العالم ليش نعرضوا البيشنت في خطر وخلوا اتش اي في بوزيتيف سرجن يدير لهم في السرجن طبعا اف ذاتس يور بوينت اوف فيو يو نيد بيتر انفورميشن توداي ذا تروث از ذات اتس فيرشولي امبوسيبل تو كاتش اتش اي في فروم سام وان هو از اتش اي في بوزيتيف اند ريسيفينج تريتمنت بيبل ليفينج وذ اتش اي في هو ار اون ستيبل افكتيف تريتمنت ويل هاف اند ديتكتبل ليفلز اوف فيروس ان ذير بلاد That means you know, infect, uh, infecting another person is almost nothing. Uh, there have only been four cases worldwide of people being infected by a healthcare worker. I mean, the whole thing is just four cases HIV positive surgeon had to the patient. And the four cases were before we came out of this and we were not going to do the system that we were doing. So HIV infected surgeon can continue practice and perform invasive procedure and surgical operation unless unless you know unless كيف كيف كأي other disease مثلا أي واحد عنده any other أي surgeon عنده any other viral infection or bacteria مش حيدير عملية يعني هو مثلا ممكن يعدي المريض الآخر أو عنده أي disability كأي مرض آخر ف logic يعني ما فيش دكتور عنده مرض ده اللي disability or he will infect the patient تا حيدير عملية Uh, okay, a surgeon should know their own status for HIV infection uh, as they would be knowledgeable about any other disease. يعني uh, أنا مش حن, مش حنخليك وخلاص ونقول أوكي okay, أي surgeon with HIV can do surgery disabled. لا ضروري يقد يدير في الفيرال لود بتاعه ويعرف ضروري يقد دو ويمشي على الكاتيجوري اللي قلناها. So treatment of HIV infection Uh, will not cure لكن عنده هو افكتف وإز ريكومندد يعني عارفين نحن ان البيشنت مش حيصح توتالي لكن التريتمنت افكتف وريكومندد الاتش اي في ليفل ان ذا بلاد اوف ذوز اون مودرن كومبينيشن دراج ثيرابي ار تو لو فور فايروس تو بي ترانسميت يعني لما ياخذ الدواء بتاعه ويجد الفايرال لود لو ويل نوت انفكت اني اذر بيشنت بيبل اون دراج تريتمنت كان ناو ليف از لونج از اني بادي ايلس وايل ا جود كواليتي اوف لايف وذ جود كواليتي اوف لايف اند ذي ويل نوت انفكت ذير بيرنتس سو ذا ايشيو از ار بيبل هو ار انفكتد انفكتيف اور نوت ريذر ذان ار ذي انفكتد اور نوت نحن ما نبحثوش للاتش اي في سيرجن انه هو ممكن يعدي المريض ولا لا نحن تو بالطريقه اللي الفريق المعارض يبحث انه هو عنده اتش اي في ولا لا لكن هو اوكي عنده اتش اي في لكن مش حيعدي حد يعني فنحن قاعدين نشوف ان هو عنده اتش اي في ولا لا غير ان هو يعدي ولا لا رغم انه هو ما يعديش لو اخذ تريتمنت وفاير لود بتاعه له طبعا في بروكوشن ضروري يديره كيف اني اذر سيرجري اللي هن بروتكتيف اي وير والماس اند بوت اور امبريبيتد داونز سليفز اند بوتس ار ستاندرد اكويبمنت في اي سيرجري ويرنج تو بير اوف ليتكس جلوفز ريديوس ذا ريسك اوف اكسبوجر تو ذا جلوف جلوفز ديفكتس فروم 
approximately the study to go in here next some 17% to 5% you get the risk in their exposure طبعا اكثر حاجه يتعرضها السيرجن هي نيدل ستك ستيتشنج في نهايه السيرجري وعاده يكون في النون دومينانت هاند للاندكس ولا الميدل فينجر والحل بتاعها ان هو يلبس شيلد فنقدر نقصه الريسك اوف اكسبوجر. The risk of transmission of HIV to healthcare professional is higher. HIV patient not surgeon HIV patient يعني هم اكثر من عدد ال الدكاتره اللي عندهم اتش اي في والسيرجن مضطر ان هو يدير عمليه ويعرض روحه الريسك لما لو يجيه بيشنت بتاعي ما يقدرش يقول لا هذا يضروري يدير العمليه فبرضه الدكتور قاعد في ريسك فليش انت تحط آه الدكتور في ريسك ورغم انه هو ريسك البيشنت هذا بغض النظر هل فايرال لود نتاع الواطي ولا لا لو ولا لا هل ياخذ في دراج ولا لا الدكتور او السيرجن مضطر ان هو يدير العمليه وياخذ الاحتياطات اللي قلنا عليها لكن لما يجي دكتور عنده اتش اي في بيرسون اتش اي في بوزيتيف ليش نمنع فيه انه هو يدير عمليه؟ طبعا فيه الستوري بتاع الن رايت هذا دكتور قرا سبع سنين وحطها وبدا يشتغل هوكي ودار قوش وسياره بالتخطيط عابي انه هو يعني الفلوس بتاع الشغل بتاعه يدير لنا يسلك فيه الفلوس بعد كم سنه شعر جنى اتاكس في هوكي فدار نوتيفيكيشن صح اتش اي في بوزيتيف الدكتور هذا منعوه منعوهم الشغل وانتهت حياته ما اللي بيدفع له فلوس قوشه وما اللي بيدفع له اجر السياره والاقساط تاع السياره رغم انه هو ماهوش معدي حد ورغم انه هو ضيع عمره او ضيع فتره من عمره باش هو يخش للتخصص هذا هي وهو جيت انفكتد من بيشنت تمام وما قالولاش ما ديرش عمليه للتش اي في بوستيف لكن بعدين قالوا له وقف شغل سو بريفنتينغ ذا ليجل ايشيو ليد تو ان ليجل وانس عن شوفوها بطريقه اخرى يعني نحن لما 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 نمنع الدكاتره لما نقول لك انت دكتور ممنوع ان انت تدير عمليه لو انت اتش اي في بوزيتيف فهكا اغلب الدكاتره ممكن يقولوا انا ليش مش هنعدي حد يعني وانا عديت من مريض او بيشنت فليش ان ليش نقول ان انا اتش اي بوزيتيف ممكن يجدوا الدكاتره يديروا في عمليات رغم انهم بوزيتيف وما يقولوش لحد لكن لما انا اخليها حاجه ليجل ستاديز ان ما فيش انفكشن الدكتور از نوت انفكتد فلما اخليها ليجل افضل ونديروا البروتوكول اللي قلنا عليه ضروري الفايرال لود يجد له فهذه حاجه افضل يعني ممكن لما تجد ليجل حيديروا حاجات يعني حيديروها ليجل وحيعدوا ناس اكثر وطبعا ما فيش ولا ستادي ولا اي بيشن ولا اي كيس ريبورتد انفكتد من السيرجن بتاعها وهو ياخذ الدواء بتاعها، لو كان في وان كيس ممكن مش هنصبه مع مع السيرجن اللي هو اتش اي في بوزيتيف، لكن عند توا ما فيش ولا كيس ريبورتد من اتش اي في بوزيتيف سيرجن ياخذ الدواء ويقيس لي الفايرال لود كل ثلاث شهور وطلع له ودار عمليه وعدا واحد ما فيش ولا كيس. تمام؟ الباقي ان شاء الله حيكمل زميلي محمد الغرياني. شكرا يا محمد تو نجول البارت الثاني من البرزنتيشن بتاعنا بحيث ان احنا كنا تو كنا كل كلامنا ضايق تمام في ناس مرات ما تقتنعش بالكلام هذا تو نجول في حقائق واثباتات ان الحاجه هذه حتكون شنو في صالح ان عادي ان عندنا اللاود ان بيشنت اتش اي في بوزيتيف ان هو يجي شنو سيرجن فاول كيس عندنا في 1983 The surgeon had required HIV infection from an infected patient. تمام. يعني هذا الفكرة إنه هو HIV يعني شنو جاي من patient. The surgeon هذا هي بعد ما عرف إنه هو HIV positive دار عملية على 3,004 patients في 1983 to 1993. تمام. فمن patient هذي ما لقوا يعني اللي اللي يقدروا يصدوا لهم 983 دارو لهم شنو HIV test. ونشوفوا نحن كم طلعت النتيجه بتاع التست هذينا يعني حاله واحده فقط من مجموعه الحالات هذينا كلنا طلعت شنو؟ بوزيتيف يعني توريك ان الريسك بتاع الترانزميشن فروم سيرجن تو بيشنت يعني يكاد يكون شنو؟ زيرو. آه عندنا الثانيه ان هي قال لك في انذر سيرجن حتى هو اتش اي في بوزيتيف سيرجن اشتغل لمده 2 ديكيدز بيرفورم ابروكسيمتلي 150 بروسيجرز بير يير دار ممكن الى 1669 بيشنتس دار لهم شنو عمليه بالسيرجن هذا ولا 
بيشنت كان ليستد وين في الدوله نتاعهم كان لسه عاد يجينوا على اتش اي في ريجستري معناها انهم كلهم كاينين اتش اي في نيجاتيف فبعدين شنو بعدين جو بيشوف البيشنت اللي هو يراقب فيهم يجو يقدروا يوصلوا 545 بيشنتس هما اللي يقدروا يوصلوا لهم وداروا لهم شنو التست البيشنت هذي ما يشكلوا الى 33% من ايش؟ من توتال بيشنتس ونفس الفكره داروا لهم كلهم شنو؟ اتش اي في تيست ولا حاله فيهم كان شنو بوزيتيف يعني اول ذا بيشنتس ابريتد باي ذا انفكتد سيرجن وير نيجاتيف وجس وات اولس ان بوث سيرجنز وير نوت تيكينج اني اتش اي في تريتمنت يعني كان الفايرال لود نتاعهم اصلا من الاساس كان شنو لو ما بالك لو خذا البروفيلاكسس تريتمنت حكى عليه خليفه كان الريسك حيكون زيرو هو اصلا زيرو بس حينقص شنو زياده بعدين عندنا الستادي الاخرى اللي هو الاكيبيشن ريسك اوف ترانزميشن نفس الفكره من سيرجن تو بيشنت اباي هندرسون واند هيز كوليجز داروا داروا استيميشن ريسك اوف ترانزميشن اوف انفكشن اتش اي في انفكتد سيرجن ريليتد للبيركوتينس اكسبوجر اللي يقول هو 0.3 لكل شنو لكل اكسبوجر هذا بيش بالبيركوتينس اكسبوجر على الجارو شافوا قاس اخرى الاكسبوجر الاخر اللي هو من الميوكس من برينز يقول انه حيكون 0.09% يعني اولموست زيرو. استاذي واحد اخر قارنوا شنو الاتش اي في بان اذر انفكشوس فيروسز ساتش از الهيباتايتس بي فيروس يقول اصلا ان الهيباتايتس بي فيروس الريسك نتاعها هاير ذان الاتش اي في يعني الهاي الهيباتايتس بي كين 6% تو 30% كومبير تو الاتش اي في كين 0.3% يعني واي شود بي واي شود اس بان دي اتش اي في انفكت بيرسون انه اصلا الريسك نتاعها كين 0.3% السي دي سي دارت ستادي حتى هي من المعلومات هذينا كلهن استيميتد ذا ريسك يعني نتاع جيتن انفكشن فروم ان انفكتد سيرجن يقول انه هو Uh, 2.4 to 24 episodes of transmission per 1 million. يعني لو تقدر تحسب هذه بالآلة الحاسبة حتطلع لك 0.0000 24 يعني هذه من 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 ال CDC بروحها لقيت إن هي ما فيش يعني ريسك حتى هو almost zero. الناس ما قال محمد البدري إن الفكرة شنو الفكرة كلها في الفيزيشنز إنه فيرال لود متاع without treatment هل هو infective أو لا؟ يعني الفكره كلها فيش في فايرال لود اكثر من هي هل هو اتش اي في فيش سيرجن او لا عندنا بعدين الفكره عظيمه عظيمه الاستاذ شنو اللي جبناه اللي شفنا تو ريسك شنو يعني اولموست 0% الفكره تمت هنا شنو تمت كيف شنو الاستجما ان هو ان اتش اي في انفكت سيرجن بدون اي فحوصات ان هو خلاص هذا سيرجن اتش اي في بوزيتيف سيرجن خلاص يعني ستوب وورك اند ما يديرش اي بروسيجر لا هذه تمت شنو هذه تمت انها شنو ستيغما فهم بشنو بيحسنوها بحيث ان هو يعني لما واحد سيرجن يعرف ان هو مثلا اتش اي في بس من قال محمد من بدري ان هي تجي حاجه يديروا الليجل بالعكس خليه مثلا هو اتش اي في سيرجن ويدير الفحوصات نتاعه وياخذ التريتمنت ويخلي الفايرال لود نتاعه لو بحيث انه ينقص ريسك اوف ترانسميشن للبيشنت على عكس انك انت مثلا لما تخليها ان هي ستيغما ان هو هذا لا اتش اي في سيرجن لا خلاص ستوب وورك لكن لو مثلا تقعد هيك ما عادش يديروا فحوصات يقعد هو لو مثلا طلع هو بوزيتيف مش حيقول مثلا المستشفى نتاعه مش حيديروا ريبورتس حيقعد شنو في مثلا لو في ريسك اصلا حيقعد انتشار اكثر من للفيروس. بعدين عندنا في في انجلند التشيف ميديكال اوفيسر في انجلند هي البروفيسور هذا دين سالي شنو قالت؟ قالت الفكره ان هو الهيلث كير وركر اللي هو انفكشوس اور نوت راذر ذان شنو whether or not they were infected. بارت اوف جوك ان هي قالت اخرى ان في الوقت الحالي هذا في وقت التغير المناخي وكي ان الانسان يعني had more risk to be struck by lightning more than to be infected by an HIV infected surgeon. يعني نفس الفكره ان هو كل حاجه تثبت ان الريسك يعني almost زيرو. Uh, بعدها اخر حاجه نفس هذه حاجات بوادر ان هن تم يغيروا في الفكره نتاع الاتش اي في افكتد سيرجنز البي ام اي خلاص اعلنت رسميا في 2014 ان هي خلاص ليفتد البان اللي كان مفروض على الاتش اي في بوزيتيف دكتورز اللي هم شنو براكتسنج سيرجري ما عادش في بان الانفكتد سيرجنز 
كان فريلي ورك بس لكن هم يبغوا يديروا في كل روتين انفستيجيشنز بتاعت الاتش اي في كل مره وان هم ياخذوا فيش في البروفيلاكسس تريتمنت تو ديكريس الفايرال لود اللي هم في البلاد بتاعهم. ثانك يو فور ليسننج هذه الريفرنس بتاعتنا ان شاء الله يكون الراي بتاعكم معنا باذن الله. ثانك يو. Uh, now we are uh, Amhent Khairifai. Um, me and my, with my colleagues are against the idea of uh, HIV surgeons, uh, they can work. I'm gonna share the screen. Okay, I think this one. I'm gonna start now. Okay. First of all, I'm going to talk about the good standard of surgical practice and care. First of all, ensure, ensuring the patient a good care and a safe environment uh, for their special needs. So the doctor should uh, be clean from any disease and the environment of the hospital and the room of the doctor should be also safe. Uh, this is uh, one of so important for the patient. The second thing uh, that is it's really more important also that the hospital uh, you should be always uh, presenting in the hospital because I have some problem here. Okay, that's okay. So uh, the, 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 the doctor or the surgeon should be always available on, on the hospital. So the HIV uh, patient or a surgeon will not always be attending on the hospital because he will get sick because of his low immunity. Also, the third and the most important one, that a surgeon should compromise uh, a safety for the patient and also the other health work, uh, workers, uh, the other colleagues and the uh, other surgeons. Even a small flu, you should not go to the hospital if you have a small flu. Uh, so imagine if you have an HIV. Uh, the first uh, thing uh, that people uh, with HIV uh, within in a long period, they will have something called uh, HIV association dementia. So imagine how this will affect his work. Okay. Uh, okay. Second thing I'm gonna talk about is that how surgeries affect the immune system. Can you imagine that the patient is under the surgery and under anesthesia and medication? his uh, body will have low immunity and the doctor or the surgeon who have HIV will do something by mistake, you know, we all know the complication of any surgery. By mistake, uh, stick his needle on, uh, stick the needle on his, uh, uh, you know, his uh, finger or something and you know the risk uh, of the patient, the risk is really high will be uh, for the patient to get the HIV because his immunity is low and the patient um, is also under the surgery so he will get it so easily by blood. Before I talk uh, about the HIV, uh, we, we all know um, Dr. Khalifa gave uh, us uh, introduction about the HIV so I'm not going to repeat it, we all know the HIV virus and uh, disease, um, but we have to know that HIV destroys the important cells on the, on the body that uh, uh, fight infections and other disease. So, uh, now we're gonna uh, go for uh, how HIV uh, transmit. Uh, the most important thing and that uh, the thing that we are talking about uh, is uh, transmitted by the blood and this is the important thing we're talking about this we're not talking about the semen and the private life we're not talking the breast milk we all know that we all know that the HIV is uh, transmitted by those stuff and vaginal fluid rectal fluid and all this 
but we are more focusing on the blood and the sharing needles between workers or even if you stuck your needle uh, by accident for sure uh, in your finger. Also, uh, contact between broken skin or wounds, uh, mucous membrane, uh, also uh, ca you can get infected by HIV. I have uh, here uh, from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, they said that people who take the medications will have a low, uh, a low load of viral in their body, but they don't know exactly yet is the viral load or the remission of the, lo uh, the viral load in their bodies will uh, let the other person get the infection or not. So they, they still don't know the scientists, you know. So even if you take the medication and you, ho you have low viral load, we still don't know, is it that real that we, I can get the infection from the doctor? Also, we have to know something really important. If the doctor uh, takes the medication, the start of the medication will start within six months, not like before that. So imagine it's like half a year. Okay? Also here, I bought uh, this table with something uh, really important and the risk of it from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the others, I'm going to talk about only the, the, the red one because it's uh, the important uh, topic for us. Uh, it is about a blood sharing syringe and other injection equipments. They said it's unknown but likely reduce risk. So why we're not we are putting the patient in a harmful position or at risk to get the infection? Okay? In the end, I'm gonna, I didn't do that. I'm gonna do it now. In the end, the Libyan law. The Libyan law, or the Libyan law, which is not yet the law of the law, القانون رقم 418 المادة 16 بتنص على أنه عدم اللياقة الصحية لأي شخص يشتغل بمستشفى كدكتور كصيدلي كتبعون التحليل أي شخص يشتغل بمستشفى لياقته الصحية أو عنده أي مرض لازم يقدم ورقة لي الجهات المسؤولة بالمستشفى، أوكي؟ وبعدين هني رح يفصلوه ولو أثبت هذا الشيء إنه هو غير لائق لإنه يشتغل، فهو رح يكون at risk إنه يعني خطر لوظيفته and environment تبعه، فرح تنتهي خدمته من وقت ما يطلع القرار أو يبين إنه he have the disease. Okay, but, but I want to talk about something that Dr. Saidi said that there is no cases about um, el, 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 el doctors that get, uh, uh, can affect other uh, patients or something. Uh, it's because that we don't, uh, the law is not uh, with this uh, thing, it's against it. So there's no doctors working on, um, on, uh, on that. Also, um, also in the end, I want to say that uh, safe surgery will save lives. So, uh, us as a doctor, our health is really important uh, and will uh, not uh, uh, like uh, get anything. We have to, to save our life from everything. Uh, at the same time, uh, by doing this, we are saving also the patient, not ourselves or other people. And we're not like against it. We're like fully against it. Now I'm gonna go uh, continue with my colleague. I have to just stop sharing this. Assalamu alaikum, and I'm Sara Muftah Jazwi. Um, the opponent team argues 
that with the proper precautions that usually uh, the surgeons usually do, the risk of infection is low. And uh, it's actually true. As CDC estimates the risk of patient infection by an HIV positive surgeon may be as low as between 1 and 40,000 to 400,000 surgeries. However, physicians have an obligation under the long established ethical principle of beneficence. This includes protecting patients from oneself once the surgeon becomes the evictor of infection. First, do no harm. The American Medical Association condemns that physicians who are HIV positive have an ethical obligation not to engage in any professional activity which has um, an identifiable risk of transmission of infection. And in this case, even one in 400,000 is considered identifiable. We also claim that by just informing everyone, it would be okay for the surgeon to continue the practice. Even though this fulfills one's obligation to inform the patient and the affiliated organizations, this once again does not satisfy the beneficence-based uh, obligation. And at the end of the day, we do not live in an ideal world. So not every surgeon will disclose their HIV status, and this will put their patients in unwanted situation. Thank you so much. Uh, now with my colleague, Hadi. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Hadi Lafi. So the opposing team has mentioned that there is medication to prevent an HIV transmission. Now we all know that there is nothing that is 100% effective in treating or pre preventing HIV. But let's talk about pre and post exposure prophylaxis. So it's a type of short course of HIV medicines that we need to take very soon after a possible exposure to HIV. Uh, so the catch is that you have to start this medication within 72 hours after you were exposed to HIV or it's not going to work and every hour counts. One of our main problems with pre and post exposure prophylaxis is that you will need to take this medication every day for uh, four weeks and this will cost you around 2,000 US dollars. So imagine that for every patient that this surgeon uh, performs surgery on, we will need to give them this drug. Every patient we need to give a budget of 2,000 US dollars after being exposed to, uh, to the surgery. So more about the pre or post exposure prophylaxis is that it's sold under the brand name Travada and it is a uh, combination retro antiretroviral chemotherapy. As I said, it's meant to be taken for four weeks course. However, it's found that it's not 100% effective. It only reduces the risk when it's administered on a daily basis. So compliance is a very, very important factor. And even then, it's only 74% effective. So you're still putting your patient under a risk. Also, like any drug, Travada has uh, many side effects that range from nausea to liver toxicity, renal failure, and bone problems. And these are not side effects that your patient needs to have after uh, surgery. And even they probably even take uh, post-surgery drugs, other drugs that are involved with the surgery that, they were, that was performed on them. So you're just adding to the burden. <clears throat> now, ladies and gentlemen, we are not trying to say uh, that surgeons need to completely retire from their careers. We're not trying to stigmatize HIV surgeons. What we're saying is that they need to retire from clinical practice. They need to follow the, one of the primary principles that were taught to us as physicians is to first do no harm. So we're urging them to retire from their, uh, from their careers as surgeons, but redirect their talents and their knowledge into academics and into um, educating the newer generations of doctors. So this here uh, satisfies all the associated ethical issues with HIV uh, infected surgeons. And these are our references. Thank you very much for listening. Okay. نشكر المجموعتين على تقديم متاحهم وضحوا الطريق المؤيد للفكرة 
الفكره نتاعهم بطريقه كويسه واعطينا واعطينا فرصه للمجموعه المعارضه كذلك وضحوا الفكره نتاعهم تو نعطوا فرصه للنقاش للفريق المؤيد انه هو يناقش او اذا كان عنده معارضات على فكره الفريق المعارض وكذلك عشان يوضح الحجه نتاعه بطريقه اكثر نعطي الفرصه للفريق المؤيد واي واحد فيهم يبي يقدم حيفتح حي... حي... المايك ويقدم تفضل شكرا يا دراجي اول حاجه انا نحكي لكم على اللي قالها زميلتي هند الدمنشيا كيف ما قلت اي ديزيز يدير اني ديسابيلتي سيرجن نت وورك يعني كيف اني اذر ديزيز ما فيش سيرجن حيجيك دمنشيا ونقول له هذه اول ثانيا القانون القانون مش ارجمنت يعني القانون دايرين لنا ناس كيفنا كيفهم نحن كلامنا كان بيست اون ستادي مش بيست اون كلام ناس نحن جبنا ستاديز ما فيش ريبورتد كيس والستادي هذا مديوره ستادي يعني فيه فيه اتش اي في بوست سيرجن داروا عمليات مش ما داروش فيه سيرجن داروا عمليات والفايرولود نتاعهم لو وما فيش كيس ريبورتد فيعني القانون ماهوش حجه كلامنا بيست اون ستادي مش جديد ثالث حاجه تكلفه الدواء اللي قالت عليها زميلتي هذيل آه ليش انا نعطي فيه في بروفلاكسس والستاديز نتاعي وما فيش اني ريبورت كيس قال ان في واحد انفكت انا نقدر ما اكلفش روحي دام ان السيرجن ياخذ في دواء ولو فايرال ليفل ولو فايرال لود يقدر يدير وشكرا آه، تمام اعطينا فرصه للفريق المؤيد اذا كان في اي حد من فريق المؤيد يقدر انه خليفه جنيبر آه، رفع يده تفضل خليفه تمام آه، انا عندي تعقيب على نقطه واحده في في طريقه الارجمنت نفسها تمام زميلتي هند هي حسيت شويه الموضوع كان بايس شويه تمام هي اوكي اي كان سي ان هي شي شي واز تراينج شنو ميك ذا ايديا لوك هوربل تمام فان برينجينج اب ذا سيمتومز اند ساينز وان يعني حاجات اللي هنا شنو يعني يكون غالبا يعني شنو في الاند ستيج اوف ذا ديزيز تمام بس without mentioning ان it's at the end of the disease مثلا او ان نحن نفس ما قلنا في البدايه ان الايدز نفسها it takes many years to develop تمام لدرجه ان البيشن ما يحسش به الا الانفلاماتوري فيز اللي في البدايه اللي هي الفلو لايك سيمتومز اللي في البدايه بس تمام بس ليتر اون يصير من الحاجات الاخرى اللي يصير يعني في الايدز في نهايه الـ الـ يعني after many years وهذا شنو هذا كله بدون تريتمنت فلو كان واخذ تريتمنت يعني Symptoms do not flare up, but tell you it doesn't look horrible as uh, you may have shown shown it. Aywa. The نقطة ثانية نقطة متاع هند قالت لي إن why bringing uh, uh, STDs and هذي. Uh, تمام. الرد uh, بسيط جدا يعني إن هي we're talking about transmission. موضوع نحكي transmission مش موضوع إن نحنا قاعدين نحكي هل هي blood أو إن هي STD. Plus we have brought many studies discussing the fact that إن حتى بالبلد وبارنتلي وباي نيدلز وكي ان الريسك ضئيله جدا ضئيله جدا انت كان تكون تكون صفر اخر الدراسات اللي حكيت عليها هنا في البدايه ما فيش حد كان شنو انفكتد ثالث حاجه ثالث حاجه ان هديل حكت علي ان كيف حتعرف ان الشخص اللي قدامك هذا ان هل هو مستمر على التريتمنت او مش مستمر أو مستمر على البروفايل اكسس بروجرام مش مستمر، في حاجة اسمها رقابة رقابة طبية ونقدر من خلالها إن احنا شو نديرو؟ إن يعني المكتب المسؤول في المستشفى الفلانية يقعد مسؤول على إن شنو؟ إن يقعد يقيس في الفايرال لود نتاعها ريجولارلي بحيث إن لو كان البيشنت نون كومبلاينت يحال إلى جهات أخرى وهم يديروا له اللي يديروا له يعني حتى يمكن يوقفوه من العمل تمام؟ آخر حاجة لا خلاص تمام هذينا ثلاث نقاط بس شكرا تمام هو آه، عندنا هند رفاعي من فريق المعارض آه، رافع يده ان هي تبي تبي تقدم تمام شكرا شكرا دراجي كمان شكرا لماي كوليكس سعيده وخليفه رح نرد اول شيء عن خليفه خليفه حكى لي انه ايه انت كنت فاين شوي وهيك بس نحن مش ضد مريض ال اتش اي في بيشنت نحن مش ضده ابدا بس وي ار سينج جست دونت ورك از ا دكتور بيكوز يو ويل بوت يور سيلف اند ذا بيشنت ات ات ريسك تشينج يور كارير از لايك دو ريسيرش يعني اي دكتور في يفوت باشياء ثانيه ما بيقدر يتعامل مع مرضى 
او يتعامل مع عمليات اوكي فنحن مش ضد الاتش اي في بيشنتس لانه اتس ديزيز يعني ما فينا نكون ضد هالشيء نحن وي نوت اجينست ذات بس نحن وي اجينست ذا ايديا ذات ذا سيرجن ويل دو ا سيرجري فور ا بيشنت هيلثي هيلثي بيشنت بس هي هاف ا لو اميونيتي فور شور ديورينج ذا سيرجري اند ستاف اند ذاتس اور بوينت Also, Khalifa said uh, earlier about um, the case. Uh, he presents uh, a case that uh, two partners, and one of them was uh, HIV patient, and uh, his partner tala mish HIV. But then tala he cheated. We're not talking about the private life. We're talking about something serious on the work. We, we, you, you're gonna deal with a patient on the surgery. Not our private life, and as I said, we're not against HIV patients. They can do whatever they want in their life, but don't put the patient in a harmful position. Sahati uh, said, "No, the law and we are not going to go on it and go on cases and stuff. But we are going to go on the laws." فكيف نحن لازم نوقف يعني عشان كم دكتور طلع عندهم انه they didn't put the patient on harmful position او they didn't affect other patients نحن ما نمشي على القانون ونغير القانون عرفتوا؟ أه بس اخر شيء ان ذا اند بدي احكي انه اسال حالك هالسؤال لو انت شخص من عائلتك اوكي؟ عرفت انه الدكتور يلي رح يعمل له عمليه هو اتش اي في بوزيتيف رح تقول عادي او انت شخص على حالك رح تكمل هالشيء او لا رح تحط عائلتك او حالك ان الريسك بوزيشن يعني اي دونت ثينك سو ثانك يو شكرا آه هند آه نعطي الفرصه اذا كان احد من الفريق المعارض يفتح المايك ويبدا يحكي السلام عليكم أه نبي نرد بس على النقطه اللي هم حكوها على ان جابوا ستاديز وقالوا في ستاديز هذينا ان هم السيرجنز دي ور اتش اي في انفكتد وان هم دي performed around 3000 surgeries 1500 surgeries and all of their patients were hiv negative so the main problem in these um, in these studies is that not every patient was calculated so in, for example in one study there were 3000 patients and only uh, one of 1000 of them were tested what about the other 2000 do they have hiv did they die from hiv we don't know that so Even though there is a risk of 0.3% to transmit an, infection, an HIV infection to another patient, from a surgeon to a patient, that is still a considerable risk. And that's still putting your patient under an unnecessary harm. And like I mentioned, and I'm going to mention it again because it's very, very important, one of the primary principles we are taught as physicians is first do no harm. So no matter, even if the risk is 0.3, it is still a considerable risk you're still putting them under harm. And at the end of the day, we, we mainly care about not putting our patients any under, and under any other unnecessary risks. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I'm sorry for the presentation. We're going to get the presentation to the presentation if there was any presentation. Okay. مش حد فيهم دايريز هان تمام حنقدر نكتفي عن انا هو بالنسبه لل للديبيت للمناظرات في اليوم العلمي المناظرات هي تعتبر كما قلنا ان هي احد الانشطه اللي قدم فيها كليه الطب البشري وهذه الطريقه حيستمر بها يستمر بها الديبيت لعند يقتنع الجمهور باحدى الافكار اللي قدموها الفريقين Uh, زي ما نعرفوا الديبيت نيفر اندز فحيكون الرد للفريقين يبدوا على بعضهم اكثر ويكون في افكار اكثر. Uh, نشكر الفريقين على على الراي اللي قدموه وعلى طريقه تقديمهم والسلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته. وصلنا
خمسة وبعض من طلبة الانتياز خلونا نشوفهم لبعضنا ونرجع My name is Sidi Mitohi. I'm a fourth year medical student from the Libyan International Medical University. And my poster today is about stem cell therapy. Now, you've probably heard about stem cells in the news, and you've probably wondered if it could help a loved one with an illness. And you've probably wondered what stem cells are in general. Um, so, what are the stem cells? They are the body's raw material. And they can differentiate into any type of cell in the body, fat cells, uh, red blood cells, neurons, and so on. Um, now, when was it discovered? In the mid-1800s, it was discovered that cells were basically the building blocks of life. And throughout history, uh, they've been making major breakthroughs in this field. Uh, for example, in 1978, stem cells were discovered in the human cord blood. Um, um, also, it was discovered that in 1997, not discovered, but they found out that they could clone a lamb from stem cells, and that was pretty incredible. Um, as for the how, um, stem cell therapy is also known as regenerative medicine. Now, we have um, six stages of stem cell therapy. First of all, um, you remove these stem cells from the bone marrow into the blood using chemotherapy. Then you get a machine and you collect the blood that contains the stem cells and you separate it and you put the stem cells in a tube and freeze it. While that's happening you continue the chemotherapy to eradicate the immune system. Uh, I'll get to that later while we do that. Then we bring back the stem cells, we infuse it as a drip into the patient's body and within a few months to years the patient will recover. Now I said from before that um, we apply more chemotherapy to eradicate the immune system due to um, challenges. Um, for example, immunological uh, rejection to the stem cells. Uh, your immune system might think of it as a foreign body and attacks it. Another thing is that stem cells are precancerous. It could have a cancerous uh, potential and of course cancer basically in the body. Um, as for the where, as for the where, uh, due to cultural and religious views, um, only a few countries actually allow this type of thing to happen or research to happen. For example, the countries in green, uh, for example, Australia, China, UK, these have research, uh, these have stem cell uh, research facilities and they actually allow it and allow people to actually take treatment. Uh, um, from that. Um, the countries in yellow and red have a few more restrictions uh, in stem cell therapy due to um, religious views uh, like Christianity and Catholics. They usually uh, think of it as an act of God, the stem cell therapy, or creating the cells or the body and so on. So it has a, more, a bit more few restrictions in it. And as for the countries in white, for example, Afri Africa and parts of South America and our country, Libya, um, they don't have any type of stem cell uh, facilities or research or funding or anything about that. Uh, as for Libya, I don't know if it's due to religious views or for funding, but um, we don't have it, basically. Uh, in conclusion, I think stem cell therapy is um, a way to treat many diseases throughout the world. Uh, but as I said, due to religious and cultural views, um, there are many restrictions on this uh, topic and many people are against it. But maybe in the following years, um, things will change because I really believe that this is the future of stem cell therapy. Thank you for listening. Goodbye. Hello, this is um, Hamid Kaladoraz, a fourth year medical student at the Libyan International Medical University. Uh, this will be my contribution to the scientific day organized by my faculty. Now the uh, topic today or the question that I have put forward today is can nano-based immune technology be used to reduce organ transplant rejection? Now, what is nanoimmune technology? Uh, briefly, it is a new methodology applied in the st study of immunology specifically 
a nanotechnology-based system or systems that can be modified to target specific cells of the immune system and deliver chemotherapeutic agents or immunomodulatory agents, priming and activating innate and antigen-specific memory immune responses. Now, in terms of its applications, we have applications that are in medicine uh, in general and those uh, in respect to organ transplant. In medicine, we have the localized, sustained and controlled delivery of drugs and bioactive factors, also the imaging of clinically relevant biomarkers and functional parameters for diagnosis and treatment. Now, applications in organ transplantation are threefold. Firstly, delivery of immune suppressants and other drugs, also donor-specific tolerance and rejections, and finally, imaging, diagnostic and other uses. Now, challenges of transplantation, we all know that uh, they are quite immense uh, and um, very, very common. Um, now, although improved surgical procedures and the use of powerful immune suppressive drugs, cells and uh, cell and organ transplantations have become the standard care for millions of patients with end stage organ failure. However, um, obstacles such as organ um, shortages, graft failure, lifelong administration of immune suppressants um, and their systemic use, they lead to poor patient compliance and causing eventual morbidity and mortality. And those are problems that we have to put in perspective for us to find a, a better or a clearer type of um, approach to find a more successful outcome. And you see in figure A, uh, or figure one, sorry, uh, we have a little graph um, that was put forward by the Kidney Transplant Association in America in 2014, demonstrating the difference, the vast difference in patients who are undergoing uh, transplantations and the patients who are on the waiting list. And as you see, it's just another representation of the many obstacles faced by uh, patients requiring uh, transplantation. Now, methodology. Um, we have the localized, sustained and controlled delivery of drugs and bioactive agents, um, A, liposomes, nanochannels, membranes and other nanocarriers. Um, to get further into that, we have the lipid-based formulations such as emulsions, liposomes, polymeric missiles, um, have demonstrated reliable alternatives to transport the water and soluble type therapeutics. Also, the role of nanoparticles in the distribution of uh, disruption, sorry, of signaling uh, pathways in T cell activation and donor antibody functions. And finally, the central innovation of the sustained delivery technology is the use of microfabricated nanochannel membranes, which, like in our, our glass, passively control the release of molecules. Secondly, we have the implantable devices and biocapsules. Um, they are nano -based, nanotechnology based tunable implant devices that have the potential to adjust drug release based on the circadian rhythm of inflammatory markers. This type of synchronization of drug delivery to biocycles using these devices represents an additional step towards individu individualized medicine. Now, as we see here in Figure 2 or Picture A, uh, these are remote controlled, battery powered um, drug reservoir type devices which are um, which are used by the uh, doctors in research now also we have figure three uh, or picture b and that just uh, another graph demonstrating the therapeutic level um, and these waves represent its simultaneous action with the biocycles of the patient um, now thirdly we have nano glands nanoparticles in transplant um, these nanotechnology based encapsulation systems uh, have successfully supported engraftment of pancreatic owls. Um, these encapsulation systems protect the transplanted cells from immune attacks and also provide a physiological environment promoting uh, cell survival and vascularization. Finally, we are looking at the imaging of functional parameters uh, for diagnosis. Nanotechnology has made substantial progress in the world of medical imaging. Uh, similar to the ability to deliver therapeutics, we can also deliver contrast agents to assist in delineating anatomy and physiology of med uh, for medical imaging. Now, with respect to the transplant, transplant field, nanoparticle approach for imaging have predominantly been used to monitor transplanted grafts, uh, track uh, dist uh, distribution sorry, uh, of administrated stem cells, gorge viability, 
uh, of implanted cells within scaffold or within tissues, and finally to evaluate drug release from these scaffolds. Now, these are devices that have been implanted and used in research. What is the material that they're, uh, they're made out of? It is porous silicon. Now, porous silicon has been widely investigated uh, for its biodegradability, uh, biocompatibility, uh, also features such as high surface area, tunable shapes and sizes. Um, recently, the multi-stage nanovectors, such as disc-shaped porous silicon, were developed to strategically overcome the body's biological barriers through unique size and shape tailoring. Now to uh, conclude, nanotechnology does exhibit a, a new way to attack the variable obstacles that organ and cell transplantations present. Uh, the induction of nanotechnology has shown success, including the recent use of nanocomposite polymers as scaffoldings uh, for the synthesis of a successfully implanted artificial trachea. New de development in nanomaterials, such as uh, the inclusion of bioactive properties able to enhance cell growth uh, and function, um, offer a promising future for today's transplant therapies and can improve the prognosis of transplant patients. These are the references and thank you for your attention. Welcome everyone in our online scientific day in Libya International Medical University. Today I'm going to present you my poster which talks about how far we could get intervention without open surgery in cardiology with me, Malakal Agori. So of course one of your family member, friend or even neighbor had a cardiac problem, but he or she not candidated to invasive open surgery, either have ischemic, valvular or even congestive heart disease. Thus, they need less invasive intervention with those devices that I'm going to talk about it today. Those devices help to avoid the open surgery, decrease the morbidity, mortality, and not for God, decrease the hospital stay. Also, something I have to mention that those devices is still some of them not used here in Libya, as in other country, but we have the old version of them. Some of those still just recently take the FDA approved. So going through back in the cardiology history, Werner Forsman in the 1929 did the first heart catheterization on, on himself and the two who introduced the diagnostic cardiac catheterization were Andrew Carnet and Dickinson Richard in the early 40s. Not to forget, Maison Sons in the early 60s described the selective coronary angiograph, but the biggest jump was the catheter based intervention in the late 70s by Andrew Christianizing. So, back to the main subject of the poster today, I'm gonna talk about five diseases and their devices, which are atrial septal defect, patent ductus arteriosus, aortic stenosis mitral stenosis, and the last one would be the mitral regurgitation. So let's start with the first one, atrial septal defect, which account for 7% of all congestive heart disease, um, had an opening varying in size and a place in the atrial septa, have four types, secundum, premium, sinus venosus, and the coronary sinus. The most common one is the secundum, which is occurring in the middle of the wall between the atria. The closure of the ASD depends on the hemodynamic and morphological feature, or you could say difficulties. The hemodynamic difficulties are severe pulmonary hypertension, ventricular dysfunction, and restrictive left ventricular complaint after ASD clutter. The morphological difficulty are the large size, more than 30 mm, wide rim deficiency and the multiple defect. But after the amplitizer occluder, uh, uh, amplitizer septal occluder, this one, we could treat the ASD without open surgery, but not for large size defect or multiple. The amplitizer crep reform and the core device, those two could down for 
a large size defect by placing more than device side by side. Also, could be used for multiple defect, which the first uh, couldn't do it. If you see here uh, the angiograph, the angiography, and how it look, even if you're not cardiologist, you could see the defect area here, this dark area. which is the opening area and the device when they start to open and when they completely open the device the this shadow dark area completely disappears so it is very very useful those devices in the AST okay so moving to the next one which is the patent ductus arteriosus uh, which diagnosis in the childhood but could delay the treatment to the adulthood, which will reflect a lot of complication. Before, that was the problem, the fear of surgery, but now it's not issue. Those three devices affect the same, but the amplitizer duct occluder have the high success rate over 95% to treat the defect at six months. The netoclude, the new device netoclude, uh, different in in the route of entry, which is enter from the arterial side uh, through the BD, uh, BDA through the aorta. This is the only difference here. The next thing, which is the aortic stenosis. Aortic stenosis, which is a degenerative progression, had a high mortality. Thus, who not qualify for surgery must do TAVR, transcatheter aortic replacement. With four devices that I'm going to talk about it. Mm, those four. First one, which is Edward, Edward Spain three, improved the design of catheter and sheath have result in delivery profile of 14 French for 23 to 60, uh, 26 millimeter valve and 60 French for 29 millimeter valve. Um, also, it need vessel size between 5.5 to 6 millimeter. The next one, which is the uh, Mesotronic Core Valve, which is one of the indication for severe aortic stenosis, with high risk for surgery, gained the core valve in 2009 and took the FDA approved in 2014. The third one, which is the Portico valve, is shorter than the core valve, re reduce the risk for the ca uh, conduction uh, injury. So if we afraid of conduction problem or the vessel is very fragile, so this is a, uh, it's a good option. The last one, which is the direct flow valve, a uh, non-metallic, made of bovine, bericardium, uh, and expanded cuff. It's in decay for severe aortic stenosis, and it's used in the USA, but it didn't take the FDA approved in USA for a patient who, uh, who are aortic regurgitation or performed it by CASPER before, so it's only approved for aortic stenosis. The last thing, uh, the mitral valve. Talk about the mitral stenosis and the mitral regurgitation. The mitral stenosis, uh, which is decrease in the diameter um, of the valve, the valve here need a new balloon, which is available range from 24 to 30 millimeter in diameter. But the amazing thing in this improvement that in the martial stenosis was only surgical option, but after 80s, it completely changed to be the first uh, option, which is the inu balloon. I'll, I'll show you here picture. This picture, this one here, the balloon outside, and here, with echo, you could see this balloon. Okay, the next thing, which is 
the mitral regurgitation, which is more common than the mitral stenosis. Uh, we have two new devices, uh, the mitral clip development and the caroline counter system. The first one, which is the mitral, uh, mitral clip development system, this device enters into the mitral valve, then open the clip, then pull it up, and thus we reduce the si uh, reduce the regurgitation. The second one, which is the newest, uh, which is the Carolina uh, mitral contour system, which is implanted in the coronary sinus, thus made a ring around the mitral valve. This device, as you see, have a proximal and distal anchor connected with nitinol shaping rope. In 2019, in France, in a cardiology conference, they show a case a 81 female had a severe motor gurgitation with desnia. After doing a caroline device, the patient decreased the medication of heart failure and the patient died after two years from cancer. So she died from another cause uh, that she had. Like she was had a severe mitral regurgitation and then she died from a cancer. So it's really painful. So that's it. Those are my references. Thank you for your watching. I uh, hope to be benefit for you and if you have anything you want to ask me you can email me um, malak.algori at gmail.com Thank you for your watching. Assalamu alaikum, I am Talib Khalil Hamad Khalil, Talib Sana Raba. Today we will give a poster on refractive eye surgery. Uh, refractive eye surgery uh, a brief introduction about it, he about an eye surgery used to improve the refractive state of the eye and decrease or eliminate any dependency on glasses or contact lenses. This can include various methods of surgical remodeling of the cornea or as you, as you can call it, cataract surgery. The most, the most common methods that are used today uses an excimer uh, laser to reshape the curvature of the cornea. The main aim of, of refractive eye surgery, as its name, is to treat or fix uh, refractive errors. Uh, طبعا, there's different types of refractive errors. There is astigmatism. طبعا, we have the normal uh, eyesight. Uh, uh, a couple of lenses, a couple of uh, rays. It goes into the eyes, and they all join in one point at the back of the eye, which is the focal point in the retina. And that for astigmatism, the focal point can be in any place or not in any place. But the idea the focal point of astigmatism is that the rays don't all, all just focus on one point. There's many multiple uh, different focal points. And uh, for, uh, and then, uh, myopia or hyper, hyperopia. And the hyperopia takes the focal point to the back of the retina. So the site is not good. Uh, and that myopia to get the uh, near sightedness, you get the focal point J double the retina, and here the distance is not much 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 the LASIK is the same idea as you can see here The LASIK eye surgery is about to give anesthetic drop and the main difference is creating a flap The LASIK you create a flap, the other you don't create it to flap, you just directly fix it But after you create a flap with LASIK, you use the laser, uh, laser to reshape the eye After you close the flap, after the eye heals by itself طبعا في survey that we did by the uh, worldeye.com uh, Three percent of the patients that did this operation said they had no regrets. Only twelve percent had to do another surgery to fix their eye in, a, in the desired amount of time. Forty-five percent never had any side effects, even a minor ones. Uh, Fifty-three percent reported initial, and fifty-nine said they had no regrets. And sixty percent of people said the operation was perfect and mm, fulfilled all their expectations. Uh, tamam. طبعا which surgery is better for you طبعا زي ما قلنا ال PRK هي it's more more often most often recommended as an alternative for people who are not good candidates for LASIK 
Addition, add to patient to get thin corneas, but it's harder for them to create a flap by the surgeons, or steep corneas, or history of dry eye syndrome, large pupils, or people who are concerned by uh, the surgery creating a flap. And the complications, in the, ther the complications are not very common, but they still happen, some of them. Some of them are very minor, some of them are very dangerous. Uh, for example, dry eyes isn't that dangerous. It can be treated by artificial tears, something like that. And the glares of halos, which are during nighttime while you're driving the headlights, you can see them as Zayn Magabshet Hajahaki. Mukin Tkun incomplete or button, Mukin Tkun folds or slip uh, flap, kind of diffused laminar uh, keratitis, the uh, non, you know, non uh, infectious inflammation, um, considered infection, or oh, post lasik ectasia, heavy with Taqiban here, one of the most dangerous ones. Uh, it's very rare, but when it happens, it's very bad. Tamam. The comparison. This is the comparison. طبعا ال PRK is the most difficult. Who it's much. It's it's just a bit safer in the fact that you don't have to create a flap. So that's really just it. The uh, healing. The healing. The laser starts straight after the operation. Uh, the patient can see a difference in the first day of the operation. Unlike the PRK, it might take from two to eight weeks for the patient to start noticing any differences. Uh, refractive error correction. I read different sources. Fili gulu in the exact the same. Fili gulu la the laser is is a bit uh, superior. But in general, they're very similar. Uh, even in refractive error correction. To conclude this poster, the refractive surgery is an excellent procedure for most patients who don't like wearing glasses. Hence, as my title of my poster says, do you look bad in glasses. Uh, or people who don't like wearing contact lenses, or, uh, although some complications may be associated with these procedures, in my opinion and in many others, uh, the, uh, the advantages is heavily outweigh, outweigh the disadvantages, and hence why they can be overlooked. These are our references. Thank you for listening. Wassalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. I will start today by introducing ourselves. I'm Dr. Tahal Al Ojli, along with my colleagues Dr. Rahda Sharif and Dr. Alina Shay. We will present our findings about how Alzheimer's affect women more than men. I will leave you now with Dr. Alina, who will start off with our discussion. Our study topic is about Alzheimer's and its relation to women. About 25 million caregivers worldwide have Alzheimer's disease. Two-thirds of them are women. 60% of those women are over the age of 60. We can't say in the menopausal state. As presented in the figure, there is a slight increase in the incidence in women over the age of 70 to 80. 60% of those women are over the age of 60. Did you know that women above 60 are twice as, li as likely to develop Alzheimer's disease than, than develop breast cancer? So moving on to the risk factors. Previously, the higher proportion of women affected by Alzheimer's disease was attributed to their longer life expectancy re uh, related to men. But several uh, emerging lines of evidence point to sex and gender-specific Alzheimer's disease risk factors, such as, I'm gonna start talking about the genetic risks family history and the apolipoprotein E gene that provides instructions for making uh, a protein called the apolipoprotein E. This protein combines with fat lipids in the body to perform molecules called lipoproteins. As we know, the lipoproteins are responsible for packaging cholesterol and other fats and carrying them through the bloodstream. The second point is medical conditions, as depression. As we know, a depression is a serious problem. Many researchers believe that depression is a risk factor of dementia, whereas other beliefs it may be an early symptom of the disease itself, or both. We have stroke and diabetes mellitus too. Hormonal related risks as menopause and thyroid disease will be discussed with my colleague Dr. Tala in the next topic. Lifestyle factors as smoking, diet. Poor diet and unhealthy diet, high in saturated fat, sugar and salt, can increase the risk of many other illnesses 
besides Alzheimer's disease, like type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, and also dementia. Moving on to, the, uh, to Dr. Tala, who will discuss the new theories of Alzheimer's disease in a moment. Throughout the previous years, several researches have been conducted to establish why Alzheimer's occur in women more than men. Today, we will talk about some of many theories discovered during the studies, researches, and clinical trials. Menopause state was found to be the main factor contributing to higher beta amyloid levels, lower glucose metabolism, and lower gray matter volume and white matter volume in women. This suggests that hormonal factors may predict who will have brain changes. Although all sex hormones are likely involved, low estrogen levels were linked to Alzheimer's biomarker abnormalities. After menopausal state, hormone therapy and hysterectomy were the factors strongly linked to the to brain biomarker difference in genders, along with other factors such as thyroid disease, which is a hormone-linked risk factor. The second most talked about theory is the my mitochondrial toxicity of amyloid beta peptides in regards to gender difference. Researchers show that the mitochondria in young females are protected against amyloid beta toxicity, generating less reactive oxygen and releasing less apoptotic signals than those found in men. Older females are likely to lose this advantage of estrogenic compounds. Estrogenic actions may be important in protecting cells from toxicity and therefore this suggests a possible treatment or prevention strategy. Another theory is about the Alzheimer's related protein in the brain called the tau which spreads through the brain turning, off pro turning other proteins into tangles leading to brain cell death. It is found that the tau network differs in women than in men as in women there are more bridging regions increasing the speed of accumulation and therefore leading to a greater risk of Alzheimer's disease. My colleague Dr. Rahda will now discuss other mechanisms of neuropathology in Alzheimer's. Uh, although the neuropathology of Alzheimer's disease isn't completely understood until now, as mentioned by my colleague Dr. Atala, there is research suggests that there is many of theory of action. I will talk about some of them now. Here we've got the, the cell membrane of the neuron in the brain. In this membrane, you've got this molecule is called amyloid precursor protein, or ABP, one of the end on the cell and the other end of, uh, outside the cell. This molecule helps the neuron to grow and repair. Because it's a protein, some of the uh, same, the other protein gets used and break down and break down and recycle. Normal, it's shut up by enzyme, alpha secretase from its body and gamma secretase uh, this shut up are soluble and goes away if another enzyme beta secretase uh, teams up with alpha secretase then we have problem because there is left over fragment is it unsoluble uh, then increased monomers called amyloid beta this monomers become sticky and bind together and uh, form plaque this plaque become between the neuron and other and disrupt signal between the neuron and then the brain function is impaired. As we see in this picture, uh, after the concentration of the amyloid beta is high, uh, then this leads to a uh, wide in the ventricle and decrease the gray and white matter. At the end, in conclusion, we can now conclude that, uh, that there are significant biomar uh, hormonal biomarkers that influence Alzheimer's disease. The next important step is to con conduct further researches and clinically trials to establish a safe approach in which hormonal replacement therapy may prevent or treat Alzheimer's disease without the possible potential side effects of hormonal replacement therapy such as breast cancer and heart disease. These are our references and thank you for listening. Assalamu alaikum, this poster giving an idea about the spinal muscular atrophy disease and three strategies for treatment. 
First, the spinal muscular atrophy is an autosomal recessive disorder characterized by progressive weakness of the lower motor neurons. In 1995, the spinal muscular atrophy disease causing gene termed the survival motor neuron or SMN was discovered. This gene produces survival motor neuron protein and actually each individual has two SMN genes, SMN1 gene and SMN2 gene. The first gene produces the full length survival motor neuron protein and in contrast, uh, in contrast to the expression of uh, the second gene produces short uh, protein. And uh, more than 95% of patients with spinal muscular atrophy have mutation in the SMN1 gene on chromosome 5. And all patients with spinal muscular atrophy retain at least one copy of SMN2 gene, which generates only 10% of the amount of full length survival motor neuron protein uh, versus the other gene. And uh, this genomic organization provides a therapeutic pathway to promote the survival motor neuron 2 gene existing in all patients to function like the missing SMN1 gene. So the studies are uh, including raising SMN levels through gene therapy and a prenatal transplantation of a human amniotic fluid stem cells and raising SMN levels using antisense oligonucleotides. The first uh, study published on December 29, uh, 2018 in molecular therapy, researchers were able to fix a mutation in the SMN1 gene uh, in mice uh, modeling the disease. While they were still inside their mother's uterus, they found that the treated mice lived longer and had fewer symptoms than untreated animals. And in a result, a non replicating adeno associated virus capsid is used to deliver a copy of a human survival motor neuron gene through a drug called Zulgensma uh, on May 2019. The second study is about stem cell transplantation or prenatal transplantation of a human amniotic fluid stem cells. Uh, through engrafting enriched neural cells, this will help reduce neurotrophic factors that are responsible for the growth of mature neural cells. And in result, prenatal stem cell therapy preserves the time window to treat disease in utero with much less cell number. The last study is about making sense of antisense, which means uh, they designed uh, oligonucleotides that will uh, change the splicing of survival motor neuron 2G to make more functional survival motor neuron protein, uh, which are produced by the SMN1 gene. And, uh, in result, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration on December 2016 approved the antisense therapy uh, through drug called Spinrata for the treatment of spinal muscular atrophy. So that's all. And in conclusion, researchers have focused on strategies to increase the body's production of survival motor neuron protein lacking in chromosome 5. And the approaches include methods to help motor neurons survive uh, surviving and to maximize the child's independence and increase the quality of life. Uh, if you would like to know more about this disease and uh, these uh, strategies uh, and treatment, these are the references and uh, thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Rani Mohammad Muftah. I'm a fourth year medical student in Libyan International Medical University. My poster will be talking about how to Libya fascia scales can aid in healing process of skin burns. First of all, we should know that the skin burn is a type of injury caused by heat, electricity or friction and other causes. And there is the three degrees of skin burns. We got the first degree, second degree and the third degree. The first degree which is affecting the epidermis layer, the second degree which is affecting the epidermis and dermis layer, while the third degree which is affecting the epidermis, dermis and may go to the subcutaneous layer. As for nil to labia fish, or as it's known for its scientific name, Orichomorus niloticus, it's a type of large genus of tilabia fish, and it exists in large amounts in African coasts, Australian coasts and Brazilian coasts. 
The skin of this fish is very beneficial in treating skin burns because they are rich in type 1 and 3 collagen fibers which they help in formation of a scar. Scientists of Federal University in Ceará in northern Brazil found that tilapia skin has a moisture and collagen that can help in, uh, that can help in healing. In Jaguaberry, Brazil, in 2017, it has been used over 56 patients to treat second and third degree burns. They apply the skin directly into the burned area and covered with bandage. Then after 10 days, doctor remove the bandage and the fish's skin is dried out and loosened from the burned skin. So it can be a little way. There is another study made in China but in rodents to study the effect of marine collagen peptides that present in fish's skin in 28 days that is being used equally on female and male rabbits by dividing them into three groups. There is the model group, the positive group, and MCB group. The model group, which is they don't use anything, the positive group, which they use the uh, moist is called ointment, and the MCB group, which they using the MCB. In histological examination, after seven days, the coagulation and necrosis of the whole epidermis layer is present and there is no significant differences. After 14 days, there is a few wounds covered by new epidermis and little proliferation of mature granulation tissue found in the first and the second groups. But in MCP group, it had other like over half wounds covered by new epidermis and much granulation tissue proliferation of the uh, ebi uh, of the dermis. After 21 days. The MCP and the positive groups almost covered by new epidermis, hair follicles, fibroblasts, and capillaries. That is compared to the model group. Lastly, after 28 days, wounds are completely covered among the three groups. So, as in conclusion, the MCBs from the Chalabia skin can accelerate in healing process and can improve in healing effects by reducing inflammation, promoting granulation tissue formation, and other beneficial effects. Besides, the fishy skin is less expensive and it's also available, and instead of throwing it away, it can be recycled as a beneficial treatment of skin burns. Compared to the gauzes, which is sometimes you replace it twice a day, tilabia can be kept like for a week, then replace it after it's dried out. Thank you. Hello, I am Judy Futaina, a fifth year medical student. Today I will present my poster for the scientific day entitled Is What a Female Surgeon Word Is. My poster is a study about the obstacles that make a surgery far from the female doctor's ambitions in Libyan hospitals and universities. As an introduction, I will start with a quick summary about the history of women in surgery. In the Western world, the history of women in surgery dates back to 3500 before Christ in Egypt, Italy, and Greece. Uh, women had to impersonate men in order to practice surgery, with the most famous being Dr. James Barry, who concealed her sex throughout the duration of her practice and was only found to be a female after her death in 1865. This was during the Middle Ages, which is are considered a very difficult and disappointing time for women in medicine. A century later, 19, uh, until 1970, only up to 6% of the medical school admissions were women and the American College of Surgeons admitted its first woman in 1913. In 2001, the number of physicians who were female rose to 24%. The fact that there are now as many female medical students compared with uh, male students in universities, male is still outnumber women in number of procedure specialties, uh, as, as, as we can see in this diagram of percentage of female doctors in different specialties uh, in UK hospitals at 2012, uh, the higher percentage for the pediatric and plastic surgeons, but it's still below the 25%. This situation would be appear to be similar with most default and developing countries. In previous studies, such as a published paper entitled with Postgraduated Medical Journal in 2012 in UK Hospital, it was shown that the work-life balance it's the main detriment in a surgical career and the paucity of the female role models are perceived and perceived sexual discrimination may cause female doctor to dismiss surgery as a career. Up to our knowledge, my study is the first of its kind in Libya. It's a cross-sectional study in two different groups of participants. First group was a female medical student in fourth and fifth and internship year. 
in Libyan private and public, and public universities. The second group was female residents in Libyan hospital. A survey was published via Facebook medical groups and the Twitter. In June 2020, the questionnaire was designed to seek subjective answers related to a career choice, uh, work-life balance, and sexual discrimination. Uh, these diagrams are a summary of the results. We've had a total of 160 participants with 124 medical students and uh, 36 resident doctors. We found uh, that 33% of participants have considered surgery as a specialty. 49% uh, weren't sure about it. This may relate to a higher expectations of medical st students at this time. Generally, houseworking and rising children are the responsibilities of the mother. Therefore, being a surgeon or considering becoming one renders these responsibilities more hard or difficult. The need for balance between a career and responsibilities are essential to maintain an adaptable lifestyle. It was not noticed that 65% of participants found it, this issue a major obstacle. Surgeons usually have many tasks, including ward around, operation, clinical patients, and administrations of them, which is in turn required long working hours. 74% of the participants agreed that, that longer working hours are a huge dump. The Eastern Society as well to give dominance and based confidence to men's abilities in the surgical field. This renders 65% of female medical students to choose the sexual discrimination as a reason that could prevent them from losing a surgical career. The dominance displayed by a male in the surgical domain is implied by both the physiology of their bodies, mentality of the society, as well as male responsibilities are concentrated on work itself. The nature of the male society and what gives the male doctor of infinite power have made the female student anxious about being harassed and disturbed. So that 68% uh, of the students and doctors found harassment during work while male is a major problem. Surgery is one of the professions that uh, sorry, surgery is one of the professions that need the courage due to its uh, uh, blood splitter and protein graphics and it require rapid life survey, saving decisions. Only 23% of uh, participants noted it as an obstacle in uh, medical career. In general, uh, surgical career concentrated greatly on the practice of the patient to do the examination, like the, the examination of the very anal area, medgenity, and the examination, as example, may cause an embarrassment to a female doctor when examined. It. Finally, 73% of participants believe that the presence of the consult surgeons and male head of surgical departments are not giving enough support and, and opportunities to a new doctors, especially female, and 14 were not sure if they had a career or not. To conclude, the balance between work and social life and nature circumstances of the world, including working hours and sexual discrimination in society, are the most important obstacles for female doctors who wish to specialize in surgery. To be a successful female surgeon doesn't always mean being famous or needing to be at the top of the class, being one of the women who changes the percentage of the female surgeons make you an inspiration. If you need to check for more information, this my references. Thank you. Hello and welcome. My name is Orita Mohamed Bajaja, a fourth year medical student at Libya International Medical University. Before we start, I just want you to think about your body position for a second as you're watching this. Just think about how you're sitting. Maybe you're sort of leaning over a table or slumped back on a chair. If you're looking at this on a mobile device, for example, your arms have been by your side, you're a little hunched over your neck, and you may wonder, what's this doing to your body? Well, like it or not, this is probably causing some pain, maybe in your shoulders or between your shoulder plates. And some doctors even gave this a name. It's called text neck syndrome or TNAS for short. Now you're probably wondering, what's TNAS? Well, it's basically a syndrome involving the head, neck, and shoulders, resulting from repetitive stress injury on the spine. 
When the head is sort of in a neutral position, as you can see in this figure, when the ears are lined up with your shoulder, the average human head weights about 10 to 12 pounds, more for some people and less for others. But think about it. As you start moving your head a few degrees forward, a few inches forward, you start to put more force, more weight at the back of the neck. For example, when you are at 15 degree, your head weights about 27 pounds, at 30 degree, 40 pounds, and so on. Well, that's probably what's causing some of the problems over time that can lead to flattening out the natural curve of the neck, as you can see in this x-ray over here, which can lead to disc compression, herniation, nerve or muscle damage, and allow that pain. Here in the middle, we have two studies. The first one aimed to check awareness and knowledge of TNS which was conducted on young adult population using a self-administrated questionnaire that included asking them about phone usage, their hazards of excess phone usage, and if they ever heard about TNS. And if their answer was yes, what did they know about it? The results were, as you can see over here, 65% of people never heard of TNS, 27% of people did, but they didn't really know anything about it. Only 8% of people had some knowledge about TNS. The other study was aimed at checking the relationship between prolonged use of hand heel devices and neck pain. Like how many minutes or hours of looking down on your phone does it take for your neck to start aching? So the study was conducted on 2,353 students by a questioning regarding that matter, also using a neck disability index to evaluate the degree of the pain. The results revealed that 66.9% of people would feel neck pain after more than two hours, and that 48% of people would feel neck pain after only a few minutes. So, who knows, maybe you feel neck pain right now while watching this. So if you do, I would advise you to change your posture. Anyhow, as for the neck disability index, the result were that 62.2% of people had a score of 0 to 4, suggesting no disability. 32.8% of people had a score of 5 to 14, suggesting a mild disability. And lastly, only 1.19% of people had a score of 15 to 24, indicating moderate disability. There are many methods in which you can calculate a neck disability index. And one of them is showed here below, through driving. And the grades ranged from driving a car without neck pain, which is grade zero, to inability to drive a car at all, which is grade five. My message to you, it's simple. Just be aware of your body. Take regular breaks. Raise your device to your eye level. Keep your legs flat on the floor. Try to keep your head in a neutral position. Sit up straight, roll your shoulders. You can even lay on your back to relieve that pressure on your neck. And thank you very much for listening. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Ibrahim Haddar, a fourth year medical student at the Libyan International Medical University. Uh, many diseases have the tendency to be more common in a specific gender. One difference that truly really stands out is that of autoimmune diseases, where females are much more likely to suffer of them, some reaching rates as high as 85-95%. to 95%. In this poster, we shall discuss the possible causes that could explain the difference in distribution. But before going into that, we shall first go over a brief Introduction about the immune system The immune system is the part of the body responsible for protection from foreign invaders and also from, in and also from internal problems such as neoplasms 
It is seen as having two main branches, consisting of two different responses. A non-specific innate response, which is also the early response, and the more potent adaptive response that takes a longer time to be activated. An important aspect of the immune system is its tolerance, meaning that the immune system is unresponsive to the body's self-antigens. This explains why the immune system does not attack our own body under normal circumstances. The loss of tolerance is what underlies autoimmune diseases. And the main step of losing tolerance is the activation of self-reactive helper T cells, also, call, also called CD4 cells. Here, the term self-reactive means that the cell shall react with a body antigen. So, before talking about the possible causes of variation in the disease rates, we shall first discuss the biological differences between males and females that could help us explain the difference in rates, mainly focusing on the genetic and hormonal differences. Genetically, males have a X and a Y chromosome, while females carry two X chromosomes. Hormo the hormonal difference is that in males, the main sex hormones are the androgens, such as testosterone, while in females, the dominant sex hormones are progesterone and estrogen. Now we shall see how these two differences, just mentioned, could help explain the difference in distribution of autoimmune diseases. So immune cells carry receptors for all three sex hormones. Both the androgens and progesterone show an anti-inflammatory effect. However, estrogen was found to show a pro-inflammatory effect and increases both the humoral and the cell-mediated immune response. The effect of the X chromosome in the immune system is well established, and it is known to carry many genes important for immunity. This also explains why females have a stronger, more effective immune system. However, this can be described as a double-edged sword, as it is also one of the possible reasons why females are so much more likely to develop an autoimmune disease. In conclusion, it is safe to say while that autoimmune diseases are more common in females, the exact cause is still unknown. And it's likely to be a variety of factors contributing to it. Now before I finish, there is one point I must mention. The topics of pregnancy and menopause were purposely avoided, even though they have a direct effect on autoimmune diseases. This is because there is a lack of available studies and no, ref and no real figures were available for me, uh, me to use. Thank you and I hope you enjoyed. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Hani Mabushiha, a student of the University 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 of the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 2014 was awarded to John O'Keefe for discovering special cells in the brain called the place cells and for Maybrit and Edward Moser for discovering another type of cells in the brain called the Grad cells. Both place cells and Grad cells form a positioning system in the brain or the way some of in our GBS. السيستم هذا أو these cells هن المسؤولات على أن كيف الشخص يعرف المكان اللي هو فيه شنو أو المسافة من مكان لآخر هكذا materials and methods the data on this poster was collected from two different studies the first study talks about John O'Keefe experiment or the place cells and the second study talks about the Moser's experiment or the Gerd cells both studies were performed on rats and there was no human trials the first experiment by John O'Keefe in 1971. As I mentioned earlier, both studies were performed on rats, so the rat was allowed to move freely in a bounded area. He noticed that certain nerve cells were active when the rat reached a particular place in the environment. 
He called these cells as place cells and the environment as place field. He also noticed that these cells are located at the hippocampus that has a major role in learning, memory and emotions. So he claimed that these cells has a memory function. The second experiment by Maybrit and Edward Moser in 2005. They explored the presence of place cells but outside the hippocampus, but the between the interrhinal cortex, behave in that certain nerve cells in the interrhinal cortex were active when the rat reached a particular place in the environment. They called these cells as great cells because of their unusual firing pattern in Huacan hexagonal shape. So as we see in figure 3 picture C, a single grad cell fires or gets activated when the rats reach particular location in the environment. These different locations are arranged in hexagonal pattern. They concluded that these cells in the interrhinal cortex with the place cells in the hippocampus constitutes an energy base in the brain. Different investigations have provided that place and growth cells exist also in humans. مش بس هيك لقوا إن حتى patients with Alzheimer's disease لقوا إن hippocampus and intrinsic cortex are mainly affected at early stages. So a better understanding of these cells and their mechanism of action may help us in understanding the pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease and its treatment. In conclusion, place cells, grid cells, head direction cells, and border cells are involved in creating spatial maps in brain that enables a sense of place and navigational ability. Understanding of the brain positioning system may help us in the treatment of brain disorders like dementia and Alzheimer's. These are my references and thank you. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Aman al I am fourth year medical student. My topic is about how effective systemic lupus erythematosus on kidney. What's the systemic lupus erythematosus? An autoimmune disease in which the body immune system mystically attacks healthy tissue in the body and affects multiple organ and body system. SOEI can specific for joint disease such as rheumatoid arthritis. It may be a multiple organ affected level of all body. حيكون معها autoimmune antibody and anti-DNA antibody. Etology, the exist cause of CLE isn't known, but several factors have been associated with the disease, include sex hormone, meaning that it's most common for female because it is possible for him to have relationship with estrogen. And foreign mental triggers can include ultrafoyet rays, تلاحظ كلمة تعرض الالترا فويد تحت بريسيتيتنج فاكتور انه هو حتجيه الاتاك اذر بيبل قالوا انديوس دامج معين في الدي ان اي هانس للاميون كومبلكس ممكن دراكس فسيولوجيكال اور ايموشنال ستريس تروما اند جيناتيك ذا ديزيز ازنت لينكد تو ا سيرتن جين بات بيبل ويز لوبس اوفن هاف فاميلي ممبرز ويز اذر اوتو اميون كونديشن سبتمز فور بيتوين بيبل مي بي مايل تو سيفير قال لك بما ان هي مالتي سيستم اول ما تشوف البيشنت راح تلقى انه هو برولينجت فيفر ممكن يجيب سي ان اس مانفستيشن كيف نيورولوجيكال اور سايكاتريك مانفستيشن راح يصير لهم الالوبيشيا اشهر حاجه في اللوبس انه هو بيتر فلاي اريا ممكن جينرلايزد لمفاتينوباثي هارت بروبلم راح تلقى بيريكارديتس اور مايوكارديتس رياكشن على السبلين حنلقوا سبلين وميجالي على اللانج بلورسين or pleural effusion. Al kidney can tell acute or chronic glomerular nephritis, nephrotic syndrome, or tantahibi a renal pillar. Mumkin at seer arthrangia, vesiculitis, mumkin tahsal hypercogalopathy. Effect of cell E on kidney. When a cell E attack a kidney, it causes disease, you are lupus nephritis, which results in nephritis. The smallest units of kidney that filter blood from waste to productus, toxic substance, exceeds a fluid and salt and excrete it out of the body through its urination. And it's will E that impairs kidney from function. And accumulate these substance that must be deposed naturally in the a body causing money septum includes a blood 
in the urine and increase a protein in the urine, hypertension, a swelling in your hand, ankle or feet, high level of creatinine in the blood. Methods in this study collected data on the clinical and immunological feature of CELE reported from 11 different Arab countries. Data were collected at Jordan University Hospital, Department of Medicine between August 2016 and August 2017. Family history of CELE was present in 8.3%. Discussion analyzed data on uh, 3,273 patients. Majority of patients were from Saudi Arabia, 39%, and Tunisia, 30%. The remaining 29% were from nine other countries. The common clinical manifestation was arthritis or arthralgia, followed by anemia, fatigue, malar rash, and renal manifestation. Most patients were positive for ANA, while anti-DNA uh, was presented in three quarters. لما شافوا كل دولة طبقوها بروحة فشافوا a voice difference between country in relation to the different manifestation. This fever was very rare in Tunisia, 2.1% and common in Yemen, 81.9%. Malar rash was common in Egypt. The squid rash was very uncommon in Sudan. Photosensitivity was less common in Lebanon and most common in Egypt. Alopecia was very rare in Tunisia. Oral ulcer was, was common most in Egypt. With the exception of Kuwait, manifestation were common in all countries, 54.4%. A neuropsychiatric manifestation affects thirds of patients are from Oman, Egypt, and Tunisia. Cardiac manifestation were common in Iraq and Tunisia and rather uncommon in Kuwait. Hemolytic anemia was uncommon in, uh, in the Arab world, ranging from 48 to 13.8%. The exception was Tunisia, where hemolytic anemia was reported in over health of the patients. This interstate difference may be due to heterogeneity of the Arab peoples. This figure shows frequency of, uh, of systemic globus erythematosus manifestation in Arab world. The commonest clinical manifestation was arthralgia or arthritis, which acquired an 81.1%. Other common manifestations include anemia, 55.6%, fatigue, 53.4%, Miller rash 53.1% and renal manifestation 50.4%. Conclusion There should be health, health education regarding the negative impact of disease active on the patient. Health physician to understand and to provide better support to a CLE patient besides rapid meticulous control of disease activity. Finally, these are the references. Modern medical advances in knowledge help millions of people live longer and healthier lives. We owe these improvements to decades of investment in medical research. This is an important and powerful quote that highlights the importance of investing in medical research. So on that note, Assalamu alaikum, ismi Yara Masoud Tuhami, taliba fi sana khamsa fi kulit al tabb al bashari. And today I want to talk to you about the researchers that were published from the, de the Department of Surgery in Libyan International Medical University. I have two published papers that I want to summarize and highlight their content of. The first paper was published on the 14th of November of 2019. It was titled, Hospital Acquired Surgical Site Infections at Al Jala Teaching Hospital, Benghazi, Libya. This is a very important topic to research about, seeing how surgical site infections are the third most commonly reported nosocomial infections that affect about 2 million people each year around the world. And it has significant repercussions on patients' health and significant financial effect as well. So the main purpose or the main objective of this paper was to find out the prevalence of the surgical site infections, identifying an as, uh, the associated risk factors, and knowing the organisms involved. So the main method was, uh, that was used 
was a descriptive case study at the Department of Surgery in Al Jalai Teaching Hospital in Benghazi, Libya. So the data that was collected from a total number of 204 cases who underwent surgery in 2018. Their data was collected retrospectively and analyzed accordingly. The results that were found indicated that out of the 204 patients, 14.7% were infected post-surgery. And the most common bacteria that caused surgical site infection was found to be Staphylococcus aureus. And concerning the risk factors, four were mainly identified as being associated with surgical site infections. One, the prolonged operative time of the patient. Two, the extended hospital time of the patient. Three, the urgent nature of the surgery. And fourth, the presence of anemia in the patient. So in conclusion, it was found that the infection rate was higher than that of a developed country. The risk factor were in fact present and identified to have a significant association with an increase in the rate of the surgical site infection and that Staphylococcus aureus was the most common organism isolated. And thereby, a list of recommendations were given for the hope that further research would be made on this matter. So a special thanks should be given to Dr. Muathman Tajuri, seeing how this paper was published by him in the Journal of Surgery and Insights. So now moving on to the second paper, it was published on February 22, 2018. It was titled, Patterns of Abdominal Injuries Resulting from Sharpnel of the Missiles, Cases Admitted to Benghazi Medical Center. See, abdominal trauma is considered one of the most common trauma seen in emergency departments worldwide. And currently, in our city, Benghazi, the majorities of abdominal injuries are related to sharpness of the missiles. So this is a very important topic to talk about and make researchers in its field. So the main objective of the study was to evaluate, one, the clinical manifestations, two, diagnostic approaches, and three, the management of different organ injuries. And fourth, knowing the morbidity and mortality that were caused by the sharpness of the missiles. So we have four main uh, areas to tackle. The method that was used in this paper was a retrospective study of the medical records of 100 patients presenting to the emergency department in, uh, with a history of abdominal trauma in Benghazi Medical Center. So from the time period from January 1st, 2016 to 31st of December of 2016. So the duration was a year. So what was found, or the results, were that patients ranging from 4 years of age to 50 were prone to this type of trauma more, and males were predominantly involved. And the results found concerning the clinical manifestations indicated that abdominal pain was the most common presentation and abdominal tenderness was the most common sign. Concerning the diagnostic modalities, it was found that abdominal ultrasound was 81% sensitive and 100% specific in diagnosing solid organ injury. And concerning the management approaches, operative management was done in 85% of cases and it really should be noted that the mean duration of hospital stay for operative cases was 20 days and for non-operative cases it was a total of 7 days only. And finally or lastly, the mortality rate was found to be 7% overall. So. Uh, in the end, I want to give a special thanks to Dr. Muhammad Neji, seeing how this paper was published uh, by him in the 4th Annual Congress and Medicare Expo of Trauma and, uh, and Critical Care in Paris, France. So a very special thanks should be given to both Dr. Rathman Tajuri and Dr. Muhammad Neji. And thank you all for listening and bye.
وجئنا الطبيب لدم حسقام فنحن بن الجامعة الودية أتينا كفجر نزيح الظلام فكنا الضياء بشمس فتية وجئنا الطبيب لنم حسقام فنحن بن الجامعة الودية شبابا ونرفع راي العلوم ونخطو بها من يفوق الثريا شبابا ونرفع راي العلوم ونخطو بها من يفوق الثريا فنحن القدوم ليوم القدوم ونحن الأمام لليبيا الأبية السلام عليكم انا الطالبة ايات عامر طالبة في جامعة دولية كلية الطب البشري سنة رابعة اليوم حابة نحكي لكم شوية عن تجربتي في الدراسة عن بعد اللي انا اصلا صراحة ما كنتش مقتنعة بها يعني كنت نقول كيف تبي تعوض محاضرة كنا نمشوا فيها للجامعة كنا نسأل في الدكتور ونقدر نرفع ايدينا في اي وقت ونسأل وكنا نستفيد من اسئلة بعضنا بس بصراحة بعد جربتها كانت تجربة حلوة بكل خصوصا نحكي على كيس سيناريو اللي كانت الجامعة موفرة برنامج اسمه زوم كنا نقدر نشوف الدكتور نسأله في اي لحظة وكنا كلنا نستمع لبعضنا ونستفيدوا من أسئلة بعضنا كل عام وأنتم بألف خير ينعد عليكم بالصحة والسعادة أنا هند خير الرفاعي طالبة سنة خامسة بشري بالجامعة الدولية رح أحكي عن distance learning أو distance education أو online classes يلي جامعتنا الوحيدة بليبيا كانت عاملة هالشيء أنا كتير فخورة بجامعتنا بأنه عملت هالشي ما ضيعت علينا أشهر من أنه قاعدين ما عم نعمل شي بالبيت طبعا كل الليكتشرز كنا نحضرون على الزوم برنامج الزوم آه الجامعة وفرت لنا إيميلات آه مخصوصة مربوطة بالجامعة عشان لو أي مشكلة صار فيها نبلغ آه الجامعة وبعدين انتقلنا على برنامج تاني اللي هو الجوجل ميت من المميزات يلي أنا كتير انبسطت فيها انه المحاضرات بتكون مسجله بصوت الدكتور والمحاضره قبالك بنزلوها على اليوتيوب بقناه الجامعه الخاصه فيها وفينا نرجع للمحاضره باي وقت بدنا اياه فكانت هاي ميزه كثير مهمه يعني لو انا انقطع عند الانترنت او انقطعت عند الكهرباء بنص المحاضره فينا ارجع شوف المحاضره مره ثانيه على اليوتيوب الدكاتره كانوا كثير متعاونين معنا يعني بس يشرح الدكتور المحاضرة لو نحن عنا أي سؤال كنا نرفع إيدنا ببرنامج الزوم أو نكتب للدكتور تحت إنه دكتور نحن عنا سؤال ومش فاهمين بالعكس كانوا كل الدكاترة كتير متفاهمين وبالعكس كتير عجبتني الأونلاين لكتشرز بالأونلاين لكتشرز ما في عجقة ما في صوت طلب عم يحكوا حدك أو ما ما مخلينا مركزين بالمحاضرة كتير رواء الدكتور بس هو اللي عم يشرح ونحن مركزين معه بالمحاضرة معروضة قدامه آه شيء كمان كان كتير حلو آه وكتير عجبني هو الكيس سيناريو آه لما كانت تنزل قبل بثلاث أيام تنزل نحن منجهزة وكنا نشارك مع الدكتورة ونحضرها آه دكتور آه دكتور والدكتورة اللي كانوا معنا آه فكانت كتير حلوة وكتير سلسة وبتمشي بطريقة آه كتير حلوة صراحة أحلى من الواقع صراحة كانوا كل الدكاترة متفهمين بقصة الانترنت وقصة الكهرباء فكان لما بدون ياخذوا حضورنا ويكون طالب مش موجود فالطالب يبعث لهم مسج انه الكهرباء عنده مقطوعة او ما عنده انترنت فهن يعرفوا هالسبب وما يسجلوا غياب لانه هالاشياء خارج عن ارادتنا فالجامعة كانت كتير متفاهمة لهالشي حتى بانه دفع الاقساط كانوا كتير متفاهمين كل اللي بحكي خارج البلد وبحكي لعائلتي برا ان انا عم ادرس اونلاين كلنا عم يحكوا واو نحن هون ما حدا عم يدرس كل الدول باوروبا بامريكا بكندا بكثير دول ما عم يدرسوا اونلاين بس نحن بليبيا هون بنغازي تحديدا الجامعه الليبيه الدوليه درسنا اونلاين وما ضيعنا فرصه وانا هلا 
خلصت مدرسة نتو تقريبا وان شاء الله رح نبلش بعد العيد بالجامعة بس بدي احكي عن تجربتي بالاونلاين اتس بيرفكت عن جد ما كان فيها ما كان فيها شوائب وبالعكس ساعدتني كثير لانه فيني ارجع للمحاضرة امتى ما بدي لانه مسجلة عندي باليوتيوب بشكر كل الدكاترة والكوردينيتر اللي كانت كثير متفهميتنا وكثير يعني بترد على مسيجاتنا بالموديل والديستنس اديوكيشن او الديستنس ليرنينج او الاونلاين ليكتشرز مهما اختلفوا المسميات كثير حلوه ما بتضيع عليكم وقت وبتدرسوا وانتم بالبيت واتس بيتر ذان ذات ثانك يو وصلنا لختام فقراتنا لهذا اليوم وفي الختام حابه نشكر كل من ساهم في اظهار هذا العمل بالصوره المطلوبه سواء من اداره الجامعه، اداره الكليات، اعضاء هيئه التدريس، الموظفين او الطلبه. ان شاء الله نكون قدمنا لكم كل ما هو مفيد وباذن الله تعالى نلتقي السنه الجايه في موعدنا وان شاء الله تكون الظروف مواتيه وتكون الظروف احسن. انا غاده سليمان الشقيقي طالبه في السنه الخامسه في كليه الطب البشري بجامعه العربيه الدوليه. شكرا.